Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about one of the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve it. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. If this show has at all changed what you plan to do with your career, it would be a really huge personal favor if you could let me know by filling out the 80,000 Hours Impact Survey, which I'll link to prominently in the show notes, or which you can find at 80,000hours.org slash impact hyphen survey. It should only take about five minutes, and I'll read every entry. As the show progresses, we're going to do more deep dives into pretty specific issues. If you don't have much interest in the topic of a particular episode, you shouldn't feel any duty at all to listen to it. Much better to skip the episodes you aren't going to enjoy than get sick of the show and unsubscribe. If an episode isn't going to be useful to you, maybe you're better off spending that time listening to an audiobook instead. I'll put a link to some audiobooks that I feel have allowed me to have a bigger social impact in the show notes and the blog post associated with today's show. That said, this week's episode covers a diverse range of pretty topical issues, and so I suspect it will be of interest to most subscribers. Here's David Rudman. Today, I'm speaking with David Rudman. David studied theoretical maths at Harvard, graduating in 1990. He then spent nine years researching environmental policy at the World Watch Institute in DC, followed by 11 years researching development policy at the Center for Global Development. He was briefly a senior economic advisor at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation before becoming a senior advisor to GiveWell and then the Open Philanthropy Project in 2015. He's done world-class reviews on topics as diverse as the risk of geomagnetic storms, the effect of incarceration on crime, whether deworming improves health and test scores, and the development impacts of microfinance. So thanks for coming on the podcast, David. It's great to be here. So we plan to talk a lot about the methods you've used in your kind of careful analysis of of these questions and what advice you'd give to people who would want to become researchers themselves. But first, how did you transition from studying theoretical maths back in the 80s to the kind of tricky social science you do now? I did it without a grand plan. I did not know exactly how it was going to work out. There's a lot of self-doubt and um, worry about direction along the way. I studied math in college because that's what I was good at. That's what I got the best grades in, and that's what made me feel secure. And I'm not sure that was really the best basis on which to choose one's path, but I guess I needed that sense of security. And I almost completely avoided thinking about what I would do once I left the ivory tower. And I don't recommend that to the listeners necessarily. Uh, and because I was interested in English folk dancing, I wanted to go spend some time in England. And as I left Harvard, I got a fellowship to study at Cambridge, where I also signed up for a one-year maths program, the, the Tripos Part 3. And I figured I've been studying math all these years, years. I can do it for one more. And it's a way of punting on what I want to, figuring out what I want to do when I grow up. What I didn't expect was that once, once I arrived at Cambridge and came to terms with the fact that I really didn't love mathematics enough to do it long term. I think I wanted to do something more connected to the real world as it was. Once I'd realized that, it was really hard to motivate myself to to stick to my studies because now it just seems so irrelevant. In fact, a barrier to my figuring out what suddenly was a very urgent question. What do I want to do next? Mm -hmm. And so I became very interested in questions I hadn't thought much about before. How does the world work? What are the grand problems of our time and what's causing them? And then in a funny way, that was the macro question. But then there was a micro question of where do I fit in? And they felt linked somehow, you know, even though I couldn't fully explain it. And I lost interest in in the classes. I remember one day I got a long letter from my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and just before a class, a lecture, and I sat down and read it and missed the lecture. And it felt so good. I never went to another one, another (laughs) class, and started reading books that friends pointed me to. And then I, I found myself... E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful, uh, books by John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, Herman Daly, and so on, which are all about broad questions of economics and ecology and ethics. And it was really exciting. But I didn't know where that would lead me. I didn't read those books and say, aha, I should go get a PhD in economics, partly because uh, I perceived economics, this was in 1990, uh, as being very theoretical and mathematical in a way that didn't impress me as a mathematician. And I guess I saw it as arrogant, you know, more sure that its models were correct even if they conflicted with reality. Uh, and so I felt passionate about these things, but unsure of where it would lead me. So did you want to switch into more practical or applied questions for, for moral reasons? Or? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, what I know is I felt a need to be working on things that seemed more practical. I wanted to work on important things, which was, of course, distinct from how important my work would be. 
whether that was out of a um, need for a certain kind of identity and self-esteem and purpose or morality, I'm not sure. I don't think it was moral in the sense that I did an abstract analysis and determined that this is what a moral being should do in this position. Hmm. But it was, uh, I had a sense that, that I needed to, to you know, move in a direction of more, more practical relevance. And what wasn't clear to me is how to link that with my aptitude for programming and mathematics. And in fact, I didn't assume that there was a link. And I only found that after 10 or 15 years into my career. I followed my girlfriend. having So I ended up actually failing my exams at Cambridge. Right. Uh, I was required to take them. So I sat for the min- minimum 20 minutes for each exam. And there's one professor I kind of like, so I wrote him an apology. And couldn't believe what I was doing. Uh, I'd been an overachiever all of my life. It was not. It's a great story, but I didn't feel glib about it at all. I was actually kind of scared. You know, this was going to be a stain on my record. But I felt driven to do it. Uh, so then after that, I followed my girlfriend back to uh, Philadelphia, where she was in medical school. And started looking around for some job for an organization working on local environmental issues without any clear sense of what I, a math major, would have to offer them. And eventually I found somebody who was unwise enough to hire me (laughs) Uh, and had a great year working in a very small nonprofit in a pretty rough part of the city, um, learning a lot about poverty there. And then after a year, maybe this is is a really interesting theme here. After a year, my girlfriend told me that I needed to move down to Washington, D.C., find something. And as I reflect on it now, that's interesting because my general approach in life has been to figure out, try to figure out whether I'm thriving now or where I can go to thrive without a long-term plan. Whereas my girlfriend was saying, you know what, if you want to be here in 10 years, you got to do this now. And without that nudge from her, I might not have gone down to DC, which turned out to be a very good move. Uh, And I eventually did find the first job that you mentioned uh, at the World Watch Institute, where I started out as a research assistant and moved up to you know a senior researcher writing about various environmental issues, deforestation, uh, energy policy, and so on. How did you manage to avoid kind of discovering the the big picture questions uh, before I guess going to Cambridge at the age of twenty two? That's interesting. I mean, I was exposed to them in elementary school. Actually, I had a wonderful teacher early on, and so they were always there in the back of my head. It could be that being at Harvard, I didn't feel safe venturing out of a certain safe zone. You know, I mean, I, you know, it was liberal arts education. I studied a lot of different things. But in, it was too competitive for me to want to explore as much as I should have, probably. Uh, it could also be some skepticism, as I mentioned, of economics in particular as a field. Like I thought of it as a place of mathematical and model heavy, and I didn't yet appreciate how interesting the big questions are in economics. So at Cambridge... Were you having kind of an existential crisis and couldn't motivate yourself to study? Or it sounds almost as if you wanted to fail on some level because that would force you to like do something different, force you in a different direction. Well, on the plane out to San Francisco, just a few days ago, I was by chance looking at emails I'd written when I was at that period in my life and had forgotten it. There were, were a few days of, yeah, what you might call an existential crisis, which came not when I first went off the rails, but when I thought I needed to inform the fellowship committee that was financing me to be there. And out of a sense of integrity, I wanted to tell them what I was doing, but also then question my integrity and in not doing what I had promised to do. Mm-hmm. And that was very rough. I think it wasn't that I wanted to fail as much as this was a life raft. This was somehow, this I didn't couldn't explain it, but this was what would lead me to find meaning in life. It sounds like your, uh, your wife has been kind of important in, in your career. Is, is she working in the same area or is it just a generally good advisor in, overall? Um, no, she, she, is, she became a doctor, and but didn't practice much. And now she spent most of her time uh, working first at a think tank on health policy and then working for Medicare and implementing part of Obamacare. And now she's an executive at a big health insurance company. So you're someone who a lot of people trust to do kind of the the most difficult empirical research uh, in effective altruism, where there's either a lot of contentious evidence that has to be pulled together and reach a conclusion, or perhaps there's very little evidence, and so we need to get kind of as much juice out of it as, as we can. Um, I think Holden uh, has called you the, the gold standard for, for in-depth uh, quantitative uh, research. So how do you think you, you got to be that good? Mm-hmm. Well, I won't argue, you know, I won't agree or disagree about whether I am that good. But um, I think that goes back even earlier in my life. Uh, maybe I was just born with a certain uh, sense of responsibility to the truth, as it were. But I, I am the child of a, of a bitter divorce. My, my parents split when I was 10. And um, I grew up from that point on uh, with the experience of there being these two gods in my life. They collided. And I couldn't make sense of who was right and who was wrong when. 
but also felt a lot of fear about what happened if I chose sides, of alienating and losing a parent. So I felt this very strong compulsion to go down the center. And if I ever strayed from the center, it'd be really well be prepared to explain why I was doing it. And I think that actually drives my approach to research. I'm, I'm really afraid of being wrong, you know, and so I always want to dig down the next level. And that's part of uh, how I've developed my style. I mean, which is, and this is a style that I feel like I've discovered it. Like it wasn't, there was no grand plan, especially working for Give Well and Open Philanthropy in the last three or four years. What I do that's unusual is to review empirical research, mostly in the social sciences, and as much as possible, rerun the studies that I read for myself. I've hardly ever done new research, but I will go back to original data sources, try to understand the uh, methods that were applied, redo them, and then think critically about uh, whether I agree with those methods or I want to apply alternatives. And that arises both from uh, my personality, as I already said, and also, I think, the fact that I don't have formal training. I never did get a PhD. And I think probably people who come through PhD programs pick up a different kind of culture and uh, maybe face different incentives, which discourages the kind of work I do. So I've kind of stumbled into this. How do you think it discourages it? Well, economics or I'm sure other disciplines are, uh, the the field is a uh, community of human beings. And that means it's political. And especially if you're a young person trying to make your way in the field, it can be dangerous to go around, you know, pissing people off by challenging their work, especially if they're senior to you. Getting the good jobs is a very competitive process. And I would imagine that people are risk averse. And so the incentives are to do new research, uh, you know, which might mean getting new data or thinking of new questions or developing new methods rather than going around and challenging existing work. Do you think the political incentives cause people to believe the wrong thing or just kind of act in a strategic way? What, what do you mean by believe the wrong thing? I mean, are they successfully kidding themselves or do they realize that there are these incentives and you know, maybe, maybe they believe oh. that their advisor is, is wrong or using bad methods, but they just keep bite the, they just bite their tongue? Well, I, I think especially the best people are in these fields are very smart and they see clearly. Uh, and, you know, no one knows better how the sausages are made than the sausage makers. So they understand the, the problems. I don't think what I've just given you is the whole story. That we, we need lots of people doing, you know, fresh original research. And, it's, and maybe that's where the best minds should be. But I think incentives are part of what's going on. Do you think if you try to reduce the, the politics in an organization or a field, do you just kind of get, get different problems? Uh, is that oh, something gosh. we should aim to do? Or do, do, do we perhaps not realize the, the benefits that you get from politics? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I haven't thought about it that way. My, my assumption would be that it's hard to change, mm-hmm. that it's an aspect of being human and it's kind of wired in us. I, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. I think there's a, there's a researcher, I think, uh, Wein, Weingast. I'll, I'll put up a link to some of this discussion. I think uh, his view is that kind of politics is a way of avoiding kind of outright violence. So ah. you get the, these like games that people play, but the alternative would be outright conflict. So it's like, it's just, you know, you, you shouldn't uh, shouldn't only see the downsides of, of political processes and game playing. That sounds right to me. I mean, I said that political behavior is human and presumably it's human because that has adaptive value, at least in our evolutionary history. Hmm. So do you think you've learned most of what you've learned just by trying to replicate these studies? And I guess in, in the process, you learn all of the methods that they've applied and maybe, maybe even a little bit more. That's absolutely right. I have never taken a class in economics or statistics, but replicating existing work is actually a, a wonderful way to learn this stuff. It's kind of like a scaffolding. And so when I did it for the first time, when I was at the Center for Global Development, uh, which is a think tank in Washington that focuses on you know, what we, call, we used, used to, we used to call third world development. I was working under Bill Easterly, who's now a pretty famous uh, critic of foreign aid, among other things, and he had me replicate what was then a very influential study on the impact of foreign aid on economic growth in the countries that receive it. And he used pretty elementary methods I now understand, but they were totally new to me. But to, but to be able to have the paper you know, on my left and the textbook on my right and the computer in the middle was a wonderful way to step-by-step learn the methods. And it's been that way for, for me throughout. The one thing that might be more distinctively about me is that I'm a good coder. And uh, there's been several times when I have needed a program to run the methods that I was trying to copy. It wasn't available to me, at least in Stata, which is a program that I've always used. And so I wrote my own program and through that, learn more about some kind of family of methods. Um, and then some of those programs have become popular.
Do you think that most people can learn statistical method- methods this way, or are you just perhaps particularly smart or particularly well suited to it? What I think is that majoring in math actually worked out pretty well for me, even though I didn't do it for particularly good reasons. I think it might be a little bit like what they say about Latin, is that it teaches you some really useful skills in what you might call slow mode thinking, you know, deliberative thinking, which transfer to lots of areas. And I think that that is part of what happened for me. No, I don't think that everybody would be able to do it as well as I have, nor need they. Or by well, I mean, not everybody needs to skip formal training in order to do what I do. Go to, if, you, if, if you know in advance that you would love to do lots of replications, the skills you need can very easily be gotten, say, through an economics PhD. So when you were looking at kind of the effect of foreign aid on, on economic growth, uh, what kind of methods did, did you learn then? It's like linear regression, I guess, but, but other stuff as well? Uh, that's right, yeah. Most of the studies use straightforward linear regression with controls. That's called ordinary least squares. Metaphorically, you're just fitting a straight line to data. And then a lot of them also used what's called instrumental variables. And there's a simple form of that called two-stage least squares. Uh, the idea is... You're trying to find something. So we're interested in the effect of foreign aid receipts on economic growth in receiving countries. But we're worried that there could be reverse causation, for example, which would then mean that the correlation doesn't apply the kind of causation we're interested in. Uh, and so what you try to do is find a variable that could only affect economic growth via foreign aid receipts. Uh, like maybe the country... Uh, happens to be a geopolitical ally, geopolitically important to the United States. Mm-hmm. So that might be Egypt or Pakistan or something like that. And as a result, gets unusual amounts of aid, and that constitutes a kind of natural experiment. Uh, so the method there, instrumental variables, is, is, a, is a way of setting up that kind of experiment and only looking at the impact of the foreign aid that is explained by this deeper determinant. I guess you would have been doing these replications fairly slowly to begin with. Why would people put up with that? Have you as a research assistant, like very gradually learning statistics and just replicating papers that already exist? Oh, well, it depends on what you mean by slow. I mean, this project, that first one, the paper was burnt by Burnside and Dollar. It was published in 2000. Uh, I mean, we did it over a couple months. Part of my job was to build a data set, which I, I was, could do quickly. That was straightforward. Part of it worked out just because I was cheap. Okay. <laughs> and so it didn't cost Bill much, Bill easily much to send me off and work on something and then not think about it for a while. Did the paper replicate? No. <laughs> uh, and that, and Bill kind of suspected that it wouldn't. We, uh, you know, the sample was, I don't know, 70 or 100 developing countries studied from about 1970 to 1993. When I went back and rebuilt the data set, I was able to add some more countries and also add more years of data since time had passed. And so when we re-ran the numbers with the expanded data set, the result just flipped. And now it seemed, the result was that foreign aid works in the sense of increasing economic growth in countries that have good economic policies, which is a very influential result because it gave foreign aid agencies a recipe for effectiveness, seemingly. And we found when we added data that we got a negative sign on the key term, and now it seemed as if giving more aid to countries with good economic policies actually slowed their economic growth. And we didn't believe either one, really. So uh, we're talking here about data replications uh, rather than kind of experimental replications. You didn't find another 70 or, or 100 countries to, to rerun the experiment. But, but what's, it, what's involved in doing a, a data replication? What's, what's involved in a data replication depends a lot on where the data come from. If they come from public sources, uh, then it's, it's about you know, downloading the data that you need, integrating it into a single file. I tend to use a relational database for that, but you don't have to. And inevitably, when you actually get down to the fine details of doing that, questions arise, ambiguities that you don't appreciate until you try to copy something. So then you usually have to send a set of questions to the original authors who may or may not answer and how helpful they feel like being. You know, how much they may they not feel enthusiastic about yeah. someone maybe doing this. Yeah, I've, and I've been told several times, oh, that was a long time ago, the data are lost, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, now, now, increasingly, I'm seeing studies, I guess I saw this especially in my work on criminal justice reform, looking at the impacts of incarceration on crime. Uh, researchers are using much, using much bigger data sets that are what we call administrative data. So, you know, a prison system or a school system, lots of big government agencies are constantly aggregating data. Or I should not, not get aggregating, uh, collecting data. And these, you know, at the student level or the prisoner level. And these may not be in the public domain, but they will license it to researchers under restrictive conditions. 
And that can be much harder to obtain. We either have to go through the same licensing process, you know, permission process, or in some cases, the original authors will, or can pass on the data to us. They have permission to do that. But that can be a more, that can be a tougher thing. I was thinking with, with that question, most of the time, if you're trying to replicate a paper using more or less the, the same data, if you just run exactly the same analysis, then most of the time you get the same result. I guess that they could have made a mathematical error or a coding error, in which case that's not true. But it sounds like you're doing more than that. You're also like fiddling or you're like changing the methodology a little bit and like seeing does it hold up when, when you do it in your preferred way rather than their preferred preferred way. That's right. There is a meme out there that uh, research is not replicable, meaning that when you do the study again, you just get a different answer. There's a worrying study that was done in the field of psychology where they you know, re-ran like 50 experiments or 100 experiments, uh, which were all relatively small scale, probably 50 to 100 subjects. And they just got different results a large percentage of the time. I don't know the specifics. And so there's a concern that psychology research uh, is simply not replicable. There have been a couple papers in economics arguing the same thing, although the one that comes to mind by some researchers at the Federal Reserve counted a study as not replicable if when they contacted the authors, they never received the data after that. I find in general that if I go back to the original data sources and try to reconstruct a data uh, study, I never get an exact match unless I have direct access to the researcher's data and code. But it's actually the exception for me to get a contradictory, a fundamentally contradictory result. Most of the time I get something that's close and I say, yeah, it looks like their analysis stands up on its own terms. And so the interesting stuff has then come to questions like, well, is this robust? Like if we make small changes, does the result go away? Uh, or, or there may be questions that are more specific to a given study. Uh, this researcher says that there's a fingerprint in the data of a particular intervention. Am I convinced that that fingerprint is really there when I test it in a way that is convincing to me? Mm. That kind of thing. So is it possible to generalize about what fraction of the time the, the basic findings hold up and, and what fraction of the time that they're not convincing to you? And maybe like at what point do they, do they uh, fall by the wayside? Is it like when you're, you're fiddling with the specific uh, you know, analytical choices or something else? I have found, at least in my work in the last few years for GiveWell and Open Philanthropy, that it's been about 50% of the time that I reconstruct a study and end up still believing it. And it's a pretty small sample. I have a tentative hypothesis that research is less reliable when it comes from a young researcher uh, who's under very intense uh, incentives to get that statistically significant result, mm -hmm. which gets you into a good journal, which helps you on the tenure track. That's a tentative theory. Usually the problems do come up, yes, after I have replicated the basic, successfully replicated the basic result, and then I start to probe. And I'm, I'm thinking of cases in my head, and each one is kind of different. So I can give an example if you'd like. Or uh, can also ponder the ad hoc nature of most of my work, which I also worry a little bit about. Let's do both of those. <laughs> okay. Um, one example, I, I did a review a couple of years ago here at, at Open Philanthropy on the impacts of incarceration on crime. Does putting more people on, in prison reduce crime? Or maybe does it even increase it? We have an active uh, grant-making program in criminal justice. So this is a kind of due diligence in parallel with the actual grant-making program. And I found 20 or 30 studies that looked at different aspects of this question, most taking place in the United States. And of those, I was able to, I focused on ones that were relatively recent, situated in the United States, and tied to the mass, the, the prison boom, the mass incarceration boom that we've seen in the last few decades, as distinct from studies of sentences of two days. That was less relevant. And then among those, I was able to obtain data and code or reconstruct data and code for about eight of the studies. And in about seven cases, I had some significant critique that I came to. In about four, it actually kind of flipped my interpretation. One uh, that I think is relatively easy to explain looked at the impact of a law that was passed in the early 90s in California called Three Strikes, Three Strikes and You're Out. And it had escalated as a repeat offender law. Your first felony would get a normal sentence. If you then committed another felony, your, the sentence would be doubled. And a third one would lead you to 25 years to life, very uh, draconian. For it had, The felony had to be of a certain seriousness. Uh, but you had people committing what seemed like relatively minor crimes, you know, drug dealing, what have you, that met a certain threshold who were then, who were then in prison for at least 20 years. The study was by uh, Alex Tabarrok, who's at the um, Marginal Revolution blog, and Eric Halland, Helland. And they looked at, they looked at you know, whether people who um, had two strikes and therefore were – 
right at the edge if they committed another felony of getting 25 to life, committed less crime than people who had just one strike. And they did it in a smart way in order to improve the quality of that experiment, the, the comparability of the two groups. So they said, let's look at people who have, let's only look at people who have been charged with two offenses you know, in sequence that could be considered strikeable offenses that add to your strike count. And then let's look at people who actually got two strikes, but also look at people who on one of those trials, the judge ultimately um, convicted them of a lesser crime that didn't add to their strike count. So you had people who had two strikes and people who almost had two strikes, but maybe got lucky. But very similar people, hopefully. Right. I th that's the idea. And they do a number of checks to check, see whether these two groups are fairly comparable. And then they look at the difference in the recidivism rate. You know, how quickly do these people get rearrested once they get out of prison? And they find some deterrence. People who had two strikes and were facing 25 to life got uh, rearrested about 10% less per unit time. Uh, and so they shared the data with me on request. Uh, and I was, rather by accident, I, I discovered what I thought was a problem that changed my reading. I wanted to do a cost-benefit analysis in my paper, as I did, which required uh, splitting out this impact by crime type. How much did murder go down? How much, you know, or arrest for murder? How much did violent crime go down? And so on, because those have very different ramifications when you're doing a cost-benefit analysis. And I discovered that the impact was entirely confined to drug crimes, or the seeming impact. And uh, so one thing I thought was, you know, it's a debatable what exactly is the social cost of a drug crime. Maybe costly for you as a consumer, but one can argue about whether that one should can factor that into a social level cost benefit analysis. The other thing I found is that when I reconstructed one of the tables that just looked at whether the two comparison groups were similar statistically, at the same age, did they have the same uh, number of prior offenses, I, I, my table didn't quite match the published one. I actually found that the groups were systematically different on uh, the number of prior offenses. And so what it turned out was that people who had more priors got rearrested more after they were convicted of that second crime and were released. So it That's seemed awesome. like there may have been a failure of, of experimental design. Like, in fact, the groups were not comparable. And so there was just a continuity over time. People who got arrested more before got arrested more after. And so that really reduced my faith in the power of draconian sentences to deter crime. Yeah, I, I know Alex. Uh, how did how did the uh, authors of that paper react to, to what you were saying? Um, Alex has been, I would say, magnanimous, and I think he's, he may be unconvinced. I think his reaction was, first reaction was, well, we never claimed that this is a perfect experiment, which is absolutely true. You know, we just did a number of checks, um, but I don't think I shook his faith. He did blog my report publicly, and he just said, I could argue with this, but but let me put that aside and just welcome you know, the the larger project that this represents. Mm. I think uh, something that affects my interpretation is that I know Alex is not a law and order kind of guy. I think if anything, he's in favor of much shorter sentencing. So the fact that he found evidence in that would point in favor of uh, having longer sentences, uh, I, I don't. I don't think he would have, would have been biased in favor of that for political reasons. Yeah, that sounds right. I, I think of him as a libertarian. I don't know if that's right. I yeah, I, th I think he would identify as reasonably libertarian. Interesting. Okay, so you looked at. We tried to estimate the impact of prisons through deterrence, um, incapacitation while people are in prison, and the effects that prison had on people after they left prison, and their likelihood of committing further crimes. What was the cleverest thing you think you did when you were trying to estimate these, these three different things? Well, I think where my, um, my energy went was into reconstructing the eight of the studies that I was able to get data and code for. And each one had a different story. There was, a couple, there was one that was just flat out obviously true, which is such a clean, simple one. This is the study of a mass release in Italy showed that crime jumped the next month, certain categories, which is incontrovertible. But other ones, I, I found uh, a lot of problems. Some cases, it didn't actually change the, my answer once I tried to deal as well as I could with those problems. But one interesting one that did actually lead me to read the study differently had to do with two studies that use the same data from the Georgia prison system, the American state. The studies looked at the decisions that parole boards make. So the way things work, and I think still work in Georgia, is that you know a trial, the judge gives you a certain sentence. It's, let's say three years. You may not actually serve a full three years. The parole board, depending on various factors, may let you out early, uh, in which case you serve out the rest of your sentence on parole. 
And when you're on parole, it's it's limited freedom. The, 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 if you look at the history of the idea of paroling and the word, I think it goes back to the idea that you're uh, leaving on your word of honor that you're going to be well behaved. And if you cross any lines, if you fail to show up for an appointment to, with your parole officer or you fail a drug test that might be required or you get arrested, you can be yanked right back to prison without trial because it's all conditional. And this study looked at whether, kind of like in the, the, the three strikes study I told you before, it made a clever comparison, not an actual experiment, but a clever comparison that was as close as possible to an experiment in order to look at whether people who were let out of uh, prison sooner subsequently committed more crime, you know, or, or committed less crime. And it found that actually there was a big effect. I don't know, uh, I think each month uh, that your, your sentence was shortened, of your actual time served was shortened, increased by uh, something like three or four percentage points, the likelihood that you would return to prison within the next three years. That's for one month. That's a pretty big effect for one month. Because if you multiply that, say, by 12 months, Hold on. You're saying uh, if you spend less time in prison, you have a higher I, chance of going back to prison? Exactly. Right. So this was seeming to say that p- keeping people in prison longer is reducing crime. Yes. And I should say that that's an un- that was an uncomfortable uh, conclusion for Open Phil, and so that possibly that motivated me to dig into it more. Mm-hmm. Uh, although, as I say, I think my bigger bias is I'm just a contrarian in general. And this study just seemed very clever. And But then I realized that there was actually another story to explain the result, which I call parole bias. And I'll try to see if I can make this clear. If you imagine two people who are identical, they committed the same crime, they have the same sentence. Let's say it's three years. One is required by the parole board to serve his full sentence. The other is let out a year early. Okay. And then you ask, you look at whether they got rearrested within the three years after their release. The person who got, who got let out early is going to spend the first of those three years in the follow-up period on parole which, as I just explained, is a period of very heightened probability for rearrest. Okay? Oh, because you can easily get rearrested. Right. Right. Actually, rearrest is not the correct term in this case. The, what she measured was return to prison. Reincarceration. Yeah, that's, that's important, actually. And so if you just think about that, what that's saying is if, under this system, if the parole board lets you out earlier, more of your three-year follow-up is going to be in this period of exposure to very easy return to prison. Mm-hmm. And that in itself could make it look like being in prison less leads to higher recidivism, uh, which is a point that I don't think had been made before. And it was a source of an alternative theory for ex- explaining the results. Um, I may explain why it seemed like less prison time was actually increasing crime. It's surprising that the researchers didn't think of this possibility. Uh, to me, anyway. Yeah, I can't speak to that. I, I did, did the, the author here is Ilyana Kuzyemko, who was, who was pretty helpful in, in helping me get the data and code. And we did have some back and forth on this. And did you manage to confirm whether that was the actual explanation or was it more just that you now have two competing explanations? I did as well as I could test whether that could explain it. It's not, it wasn't an easy thing to parse out. Uh, so I couldn't conclusively decide either way. And the, the, it, gets pretty, it gets pretty in the weeds pretty fast if I say more. But I did some initial variants of the main regression where I tried to deal with this effect. I may have overcorrected with it. But the results were consistent with this being the cause of of the, the headline findings. Any other uh, clever tricks that you want to discuss from that? Oh, gosh. There's another study of deterrence. We talked about one, three strikes. This study was uh, by David Adams, uh, looked at the effects of a state legislature passing gun add-on laws. So the idea is if you commit a burglary without a gun, the sentence is X. If it involved a gun, it's X plus Y. And so he looked at whether, you know, in the months or in the years following the adoption of such a law, crimes involving guns suddenly dropped or not and looked across many states at once. I wouldn't I don't know if it was particularly clever, but I was able to rethink the study and I think add value by going back to the underlying data source. The crime data all come from the FBI. And you can go to the FBI website and download uh, you know, a number of gun robberies or whatever in each state in each year pretty easily. But the raw data are actually supplied by what are called Law enforcement agencies, our local enforcement agencies, the LEAs, which are, it could be the New York City Police Department or it could be a much smaller unit. And they report monthly. And it's a system of reporting that goes back at least to the 60s and probably far longer. And the data are messy, but it means that you can get not only much higher resolution geographically, but much sharper information on timing, month to month to month to month. And that matters because the law may have, a new law may have passed in March. And you can see whether there's a change in crime rates 
in April, or six months later, rather than just looking year to year, which is fuzzier. Uh, so with a lot of effort, I was able to download all of the FBI monthly raw data and then pull it together. It's, it's messy data, so that took a big effort. And then there were a lot of missing data points or bad data points, so I had to develop some algorithms for uh, identifying bad or missing data and then using a pretty fancy technique called multiple imputation to make guesses about what data would go there in a way that would not introduce false certainty by making unknown numbers look known. It was a big number crunching monster, but the end result was graphs that uh, had monthly resolution rather than annual resolution and the seeming drop that was, that was coincidental with the adoption of laws kind of disappeared and just like a very smooth decline. How much time do you spend just trying to get data and code that you need to try to do a replication? Usually the coding will take longer than the data, especially if it's com- computation intensive, that, that slows things down. But I'm trying different things and, you know, it's, it's, it's a coding project if you develop algorithms and you run things a bunch of ways. But that was a big part of, I mean, the, the incarceration and crime report probably took a full-time equivalent year. And the majority of that was the reconstruction of, of these eight studies. How often, when you just email the authors, are they like, well, here's a spreadsheet? That is the exception, unfortunately. More often I get the data because either the primary data is in the public domain or the publishing journal required that it be posted somewhere. Is it getting better? More journals are requiring uh, data sharing. And I think maybe younger researchers, some of them are more apt to share the data. It's just tricky, though, because they can understand the principle, but they're also concerned about getting tenured. Mm -hmm. And... I, if I'm asking to reconstruct their data set, I'm a risk to them. And that's a pretty important thing to them. Do they see any upside from you approving what they write? Uh, yes, but I don't think it justifies the downside. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, for example, I've had someone who say, I will happily share the data and code with you after I get published. And I just have to accept that. And that's not the ideal from the point of view of you know getting to the best knowledge as quickly as possible. But it's also understandable. Yeah, it's the system we have. So what did you end up concluding overall on the, the question of whether longer sentences or letting people out of prison would, uh, would raise crime? Right. Well, as you said, there's the before, during, and after effects of crime. Mm-hmm. Uh, the before effect is deterrence. You know, does having tougher sentences cause people not to avoid crime? And I've just mentioned two studies to you of deterrence, one on the gun laws, one on three strikes in California. Mm-hmm. Both of those I ended up not believing and came to the conclusion that there really isn't much deterrence at the kinds of margins that we're talking about here in policy discussions. Obviously, if there was no criminal justice system, there would be more crime. I think that's you know, pretty clear. But at the margin we're at, we could, I think it's safe to say that deterrence is essentially zero. Hmm. Then there's the during effect. Does crime fall significantly when you imprison more people? And the answer is yes. There's a bunch, several cases where, like here in California even, We've had two criminal justice reforms and they went into effect in 2011 and 2014. And certain acquisitive crimes like motor vehicle theft have gone up in a way that seems pretty clearly connected with uh, those reforms, much less with violent crime, though. Then there are the after effects, and this is where it gets most complicated. Being in prison, you could imagine, could reduce the amount of crime you commit afterwards. Maybe you get new, there's jobs training, or you, you learn to read, or you're helped off with your drug problem, or you're scared straight by the experience. But it's also easy to imagine that being in prison just makes things worse long run, that you're more alienated from society, that you're more close friends with other th- you know, other criminals and you learn their techniques. You have less ability to get a real job because you're marked as a felon. So that can swing e- either way and it could dominate the overall answer. The majority of the studies that I looked at that are set in the modern American context, putting extra weight on the ones that I could actually replicate and then came out believing say that the after effects are harmful. So yes, you get a short-term benefit when you put more people in prison, reducing crime, but in the long run, that seems to backfire, and increasing, actually increasing crime when you get out. So as a very rough estimate, I would say the, we're at a margin in the United States today where, by the way, we have huge numbers of people in prison. You know, Per population, we're the highest in the world except possibly North Korea. We're at a margin where incarceration is not affecting crime. The, the marginal effect is zero. And now we did a really interesting thing. This was prodded in part by Holden and his concerns that I was biased in the direction that was comfortable for us. Mm-hmm. He, asked, he had me come up with a devil's advocate reading. And then we also did a cost-benefit analysis using both my favored reading of the evidence and the devil's advocate. 
Um, the devil's advocate says actually there is deterrence uh, and actually the after effects usually are beneficial. So putting people in prison longer actually reduces crime. And, and the cost benefit analysis is a whole, whole its own world. You know, how, what's the dollar value of a rape? And there are different methods that people have come up with to answer that. And there are some answers out there that are usually used. And of course, they're highly debatable. But I found that if we take the devil's advocate reading, which is to say that decarceration will increase crime, and we use the highest valuations on crime, which again is in favor of the devil's advocate. So we really put a lot of dollar value on those the cost of that extra crime. That it came out about break even. Each person year of well, if I, when I talk about incarceration, that I would say each person year of lost liberty was a cost of about ninety two thousand dollars. That's dominated by valuing a year of liberty at fifty thousand dollars, and then also the cost of prison. And that it was averting about ninety two thousand dollars in crime. The numbers came out exactly the same, which should not be. That's false precision. So even in the least favorable reading, the, the least favorable value cost benefit valuation of the least favorable reading of the evidence, it was break even. I'm surprised you didn't talk more about crime in prison, which I feel would uh, really push things in the direction that it sounded like you wanted to go. Because, yes. I mean, prisons are just hotbeds of crime. That's an excellent point. I think my intuition, it actually absolutely does bear mentioning, and I should have mentioned it. Yes, if you count the crime that goes on in prison, that would presumably shift the calculation a lot. Putting somebody behind bars may therefore just almost on the surface increase crime. I've de-emphasized it for two reasons. One is there's not much data on it, so I just couldn't hard to know what to do with it. The other, I think, is my intuition that the audience I most want to persuade may not care. You they know, view it as part of the punishment, perhaps. Right. Yeah, that's part. You know, if you want to deal with that, you shouldn't have gotten yourself in trouble. And so I don't have to agree with that to feel like the more effective argument for reaching across, you know, to skeptics is to, is to de-emphasize that. Mm. But you're right; it absolutely bears emphasis. Yeah. How did people take this conclusion, given that it's a potentially politically charged issue. Were, were people persuaded? Uh, I think internally it was accepted. I mean, there was no controversy here because it, it, it happened to be compatible with what we're doing. Mm. Uh, I think we've talked to some uh, activist groups on criminal justice reform who have been excited about the findings and want to figure out how best to communicate it and use it. And they're talking to legislators. Le- legislators. I haven't gotten a lot of pushback from skeptics So either they didn't bother reading it or they thought it was okay. Probably they didn't bother reading it. What character traits do you think are most important in a a researcher? You know, there are different kinds of research. And research, like any place else, any other field, benefits from diversity. We shouldn't all be the same way and optimize on the same traits. So I can reflect on what has made me useful in my way, in my distinctive way. But I wouldn't suggest that that's what everybody should aspire to. It's more about figuring out who you are and how you can contribute. I feel a strong desire to get to the bottom of things in order to reduce the chance that I'm wrong. I have aptitude with quantitative things and coding, and those are all very useful. I'm interested in hearing and synthesizing different views, whether about methodology or much broader questions. So I have sort of a pluralist instinct in that way. But there are lots of great researchers who contribute by being less interested in what other people do and just pursuing their own genius you know, with aggression. So a couple of years ago, you worked uh, at, the, at the Gates Foundation and then moved to the kind of GiveWell uh, OpenFill cluster that, that you're helping now. How do you find that the two compare given that the Gates Foundation is, I guess, has, has almost 60 times as many staff? Well, maybe I should first explain how I ended up at Gates since it's, yeah. as people may be interested in career moves. I was at uh, the Center for Global Development for 11 years. Uh, when I joined there, it was a similar experience to earlier in my life. Like I knew I had some interests. Uh, and some aptitude, but really wasn't sure how I would be useful. And uh, Nancy Birdsall, the president, was kind enough to hire me and find ways to use me so over time. And it was there that I first discovered this uh, interest in replication. Um, but I think one thing that I lacked was that I had never worked in a decision-making organization, not uh, an aid agency or any other part of the government, not a philanthropy, not a business. And I think if you're interested in uh, policy-relevant work, like, say, working at a think tank, it may be very productive to move back and forth between the think tank and a more practical setting. Because when you're in the practical setting, you don't have as much time to think, but you encounter lots of questions that you wish somebody was figuring out. And then when you have some space to actually think and research, then you have the inspiration that comes from that really practical experience. And I don't think I had that. And so after 10 or 11 years, I'd finished up my work on microfinance, 
and was having a lot of difficulty motivating myself around a new topic. I felt like I should be able to figure out what's a valuable way to deploy my time and I'm struggling. And some point, some point I realized it was time for me to go. I was no longer growing and decided I should work in a more decision-making institution. I went through a job search process and ended up at the Gates Foundation office in, uh, in, in D.C., where I lasted six months. <laughs> I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that I was fired. And I probably shouldn't go too much into what happened. It wasn't like there was some dramatic story, but it, it clearly wasn't a good fit. It's a very big place. It's like 1,200 employees, I think, last I heard, plus a lot of contractors. And it's giving away, I don't know, $4 billion a year or something like that. Whereas I think open philanthropy might be up to 100 or maybe even 200 million. It's about 200 million. So it was giving away about 20 times as much, but with far more than, I don't know, what would it be? <laughs> far more than 20 times the 60 staff. times or something. This maybe is a very lean place here. So it's a large organization with hierarchy and various teams and and um, we talked about politics earlier. To, to, to do well there, you know, have to know how to work well in a compl- very complex social structure. And I don't think I ever really learned that. I always lived in small organizations. And part of that is about understanding that speech can both be about getting to the truth when you're talking about some substantive topic, but it can also have political implications. Maybe a disagreement won't just be taken as a um, factual issue. A factual issue, but it, you know, it can be felt in another way. And uh, and I, I think I just wasn't uh, thriving there in the way that I needed to. Have you since kind of tried to learn those skills or are you just trying to find organizations where it doesn't matter so much? That's a great question. I think mostly I have failed to improve in that way. Do, been, do you think maybe that's a virtue in, in, a, in a lot of cases that, that if you learn how to do politics, then it would like in, infect your uh, research approach? I think it is a virtue in my case, and, but it may be a luxury that I don't have to think about it. You know, a, a broad thought that I have having experienced met many impressive people in D.C. over the years, is that people's great strengths or their strengths are also their great weaknesses. They're often the same thing. It's just whatever's most distinctive about you is really useful in some contexts and really a problem in others. And we're fortunate, people like you and me and people listening, to have a lot of uh, autonomy in life. And we're not all just bound to be rice farmers. And so we're fortunate enough to try to find our place in life where what is distinctive about us is more often a strength than a weakness. So I feel like I've had the luxury to not learn to be a very good politician. And that's working out for me because I've managed to find places where it doesn't matter as much or, or it actually would be a detriment even. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a question that's come up in 80,000 Hours is uh, how much to try yeah, improving on your weaknesses versus just moving to somewhere that weaknesses don't matter or, or they even look like strengths. And I think the research we've read suggests that people can change their character somewhat, although it's quite a gradual process. So they, they can, over a decade, like get, get rid of their weaknesses with, with quite a lot of effort. But it's not easy and you can't do that on too many things at a time. Uh, whereas you can potentially move location quite fast to a place where, you know, Having low conscientiousness, maybe, or being a bit too outspoken, uh, are not such big problems, and, and your strengths can sh- can shine through. Uh, do, you, do you have a view on that? No. Sounds like you, you're in favor of the moving rather than changing. Oh, I don't know. I mean, what you just described sounds very plausible to me, and I hear it mostly as a potential source for self criticism. In other words, um, I haven't tried to improve myself that way. Maybe I could have, and maybe my uh, reluctance to try to improve is is a fault. You know, it maybe reflects my um, stubbornness, right? Uh, my resistance to feedback from others. So it sounds like, I mean, what is implied in what you're saying is one should do both, I think. Lifelong growth is a great thing. And especially when it gets older, there's, there's a strong temptation not to push yourself to change. It mm-hmm. seems good to resist that. But you also have to approach yourself with humility and recognize you can only push yourself to change so fast. And in the meantime, if there are cheaper ways of Finding ways to contribute and being happy, you know, go for it. All right. Let's talk a bit more about your, your research approach. Uh, so before you've even chosen what question to research, I mean, how do you figure that out? Do, do you often kind of turn down projects because you don't think you'll be able to make a good go of it? Uh, that has happened occasionally that I've turned something down because I just don't feel like I can contribute much. But what I like about, really like about being at GiveWell and, and Open Phil is that people come to me with questions that have practical relevance for decisions that are being made. Or, you know, conceivably could be reversed, right? And that in itself is inspiration. And I talked to you about how I've lacked that kind of inspiration that comes from practical experience. Where here, in a sense, I get it. Uh, 
a topic like the impact of incarceration on crime looked really boring to me. But once I knew that it actually mattered for things we were doing with real money, that was the motivation to get into it. And almost anything is interesting once you get into it. And I should say, you know, uh, I don't see myself as somebody who can only do uh, research reviews. That's what I've done here out of a kind of, you know, comparative advantage type argument. But I, at the moment, actually, I've, I've pivoted to something new that is very raw in my mind, so I probably can't speak about it very clearly, which is to participate in the internal discussions that we're having about uh, what we call cost prioritization, the philosophical issues that come up when you think about how much to put into animal welfare versus taking care of people and how much to worry about problems today versus the far future. And that's not nearly as a quantitative a set of questions, but I still feel that I can contribute in the same spirit of seeking out lots of different views and trying to synthesize and think critically. When you start uh, a new project, can you kind of walk us through the, the process that, that you would go through? Do, do, do you start by kind of trying to collect the data or do you like, read a lot broadly about the, the topic to kind of situate yourself in it? It's, it's a very organic and ad hoc search process, usually. So typically when somebody comes to me with a new topic, they'll say, we read this or you know, we've got this paper we think you should look at. And that's enough to start exploring the network. You read that, it cites other sources. Um, in some cases, you Google authors' names or even talk to them. So it, it's, not, it's not very s- structured, really. And I sometimes worry about that. Uh, I, I think, you know, the mo- my most recent replication was of a, a paper on the impacts of the deworming campaign in the American South about 100 years ago. And that one, actually, and then it was d- done by uh, an economist named Hoyt Blakely, and he did a companion paper using similar methods and some of the same data, looking at the impact of malaria eradication. And especially in the companion paper, I replicated both. I made an effort for the first time to pre-register, to say, here's what I intend to do, and then put that in a, on a third-party website that could prove when I had submitted the document. And that was out of a sense that I need to start becoming more conscious of what I'm actually doing. Mm. Uh, and then there's potential for biases to creep in if I don't do that. Uh, but to date, it's, it's been pretty informal exploration, most of the time. What, what kind of biases would, would you worry about? Well, this came up, this was some good feedback I got from Holden, Holden Karnowski, who's the director at Openfill and is my boss, when I was working on the impacts of incarceration on crime. He wanted to know how did I choose which studies to really dig into and try to replicate, because he worried about bias. And he was mostly worried about bias of the kind that would make my results comfortable. You know, he was, you know, he wanted me to make sure that I was doing everything I could to make us uncomfortable because <laughs> that's where the value of this work comes from. And I realized I didn't have a great answer for him and that he was probably right. There were certain studies that I was more skeptical of because they came to a conclusion that would challenge open fill in his priorities. And so I was more apt to dig into those. Uh, although, to be honest, I think a bigger bias I have is um, against anybody who claims to have a really statistically significant and large result. Uh, from non-experimental data, especially. I'm just sort of a contrarian. I think I'm more of a contrarian than biased one way or another on a lot of these issues. But I realized I didn't have a complete good answer for him. So then when we were re- revising the document, I made a second round of attempts to get data and code in a more systematic way. You, you mean to choose which papers to scrutinize yeah, more random? Yeah, well, I, you know, I had already replicated, I don't know, six or eight of them. And um, I then wrote to authors of other papers that were in a certain sampling frame that I described earlier, you know, set in the U.S., not too long ago, focusing on margins of punishment that are relevant for the mass incarceration debate. Not you know many years, not many days, which ended up not yielding any more studies as it happens. But was an education for me that I need to be a better able to explain the path that I'm choosing. Do you start writing early or do you kind of spend a lot of time playing with the data before you put pen to paper? I would say that I do not spend writing, so I start writing early. I think it can be a good discipline worked with a guy years ago named Alan Durning, um, who's a, founded uh, the Sightline Institute, which, which I think we fund in Seattle. And he always said the first thing you should do when you're embarking on a, like a long project that could take a year of writing is write the press release. And probably once you get to the end of the project and you're actually ready to launch it, you'll tra- completely trash that press release. But it can be really good for helping you focus on what bottom line. You know, What are the key questions that you're trying to get at? How do you know when to stop? I think it's a synonymous, in a way, with the question of how do I make judgments? Because once I reach a judgment, then I feel like it's okay to stop. That doesn't mean I can't learn more, but it's an important turning point. 
But actually, I'm thinking a lot here. I'm not even sure I believe what I just said because in a lot of cases, you just have to make the best call you can with the data you have. We always have to do that. And it may not be as much as you'd like. I, I'm not sure. I think we all go through processes of trying to figure things out. And at some point, we get, get to a sense a point where we have a settled understanding. It may subsequently evolve, but it's, it's a mature thing that's ready to be shared with the world. Has anyone written a guide to doing what you do, or is it somewhat distinctive? Uh, I'm not aware of uh, anything like that. We just had a very informal meeting here at Open Phil where I was asked to speak for a few minutes on what I look for when I'm reading research. And I struggled with it because a lot of what I end up doing with a study is very specific to that study. There are some principles, but I have not... Uh, seen them written up like that in any way okay so if it's if it's hard to generalize so we should yeah. dig into some specific analyses that you've done and i guess yeah figure out what what methods you use in each one uh let's tackle the geomagnetic storms topic first which I, which i found particularly interesting so in 2015 and then again in 2017 you looked at the, the risk of geomagnetic storms messing with the electrical grid and i guess other electrical equipment so yeah what approach did you take there and feel free to go into as much detail as you want so a lot of our interest at, at OpenPhil is in existential risks, and there are many of them, as I'm sure many of the listeners already know. A few years ago, actually when I was working as a consultant before I came, became an employee, I was asked to dig into this one question of geomagnetic storms. What happens is, you know, and I, as is obvious, I'm not a physicist, I'm, I'm a statistician more than anything else, so I don't understand a lot of what I'm about to describe. There are these big cataclysms on the sun. And they cause the ejection of coronal matter, which then gets you know, hurled away from the sun and might collide with the earth. It is typically magnetically charged. That is, the, the, the particles are systematically magnetically oriented. And so it's like this little magnet coming, coming and clobbering the earth. And smaller versions of this are what cause the aurora borealis. Uh, and as with the aurora borealis, and I guess the southern one is called the aurora australis. Yeah, you yeah. tell me. I think that's right. The, 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 the Earth's magnetic field actually channels the uh, material towards the poles. And so at high latitudes is where you get the impact. And it's a little bit like, you know, if you do a cannonball or, you know, you drop something huge into the water. It creates a lot of turbulent um, disturbance. And uh, what happens is that the mag local magnetic field, especially at high latitudes, will start to oscillate in kind of random but high amplitude ways. Changing magnetic fields in turn induce electrical currents in any wires that happen to be nearby. One scenario that people have been worried about is that uh, a really big storm could induce really large currents in long distance power lines, which would fry the transformers that are at either end of these. Um, these, these are what change the voltage. A dam might produce power, I don't know, what, 100 volts or whatever. And then that gets stepped up to a much higher voltage, like 765,000 volts or even a million volts for long distance transmission because that reduces the energy loss. And then there's a transformer at the receiving end, which then steps down the voltage again. The, the little boxes that you use to charge your phones and uh, computers, those are transformers. Mm -hmm. They're converting the, the oscillating current from the wall into the direct current that your computers and phones need. But there are also transformers that are as big as houses. And these could get fried. These could just get you know, uh, destroyed in seconds, maybe, or minutes, which would then cause blackouts. And the worry is that this could happen over a very large area, a continental scale area. And then we wouldn't have to replace hundreds of these giant transformers. And in the meantime, there would be uh, large scale blackouts lasting for months. There are not a lot of these, there are not a lot of spares around. These are custom built, huge things. And they can take months each to manufacture. And a long-term large area blackout could be, could be, could be an economic, economic and humanitarian crisis. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have power, then you can't. Maybe your pipeline shut down. Maybe the hospitals don't work, et cetera. Can't move food around. Can't move food around, yeah. Can't store food. Yeah. Right. All these systems that depend on each other and power could collapse. So it's pretty scary. And there's a couple authors who, in particular, their work on this possibility have been cited widely in the press and we're getting attention. I dug into it and did my best to understand the physics and the astronomy and then gravitated to a statistical aspect of the question because that's where I could make the biggest contribution. And what I looked at was what the history of these events 
allows us to say about the probability of the, of more in the future. So there are different ways of measuring the magnitude of a geomagnetic storm. And depending on how you measure, the data code are available for 20 years or 50 years. One measure is complicated reasons when a storm hits, it actually reduces the strength of the Earth's magnetic field at the equator. So you can collect minute by minute magnetic data at geomagnetic observatories. And that is done. And those, there's actually four observatories that are used to construct this particular index, which is called the uh, Disturbance Storm Time Index, DST Index. And that then gives you a number to represent uh, geomagnetic disturbances. And we have that going back to 1957. And one can model that and ask, well, what is the probability of uh, there being a storm in the next decade of a certain magnitude or higher? The example that everybody worries about was a big storm that hit in 1859. Now, of course, in 1859, there wasn't much power structure to worry about. Apparently, a few telegraph operators were electrocuted, you know, and there were spectacular auroras quite far towards the equator in both hemispheres. People wonder what would happen if we had a storm that big again today. I came away with a kind of paradoxical message. I think that the people whose work got the most attention were exaggerating the risk. Like if you just do the analysis, and I can explain the specifics, they were overestimating. I, I, should, I should qualify that. It's not that they were exaggerating the risk, risk because the risk is unknown. But their extrapolations for history, from history were not well done and were overshooting. On the other hand, there's so much we don't know. This is a pretty under-researched area. And this is an area where... We actually can learn more. You know, economists often struggle to figure out whether inflation causes growth or the other way around. And it's just sort of a thing that goes on forever. They can never figure it out. But with money, we could, you know, figure out more about um, how these kinds of storms affect actual transformers. That's like an actual research program that just can be done. So there's a real opportunity to learn more and reduce our uncertainty. I came to be persuaded that this big storm in 1859 called the Carrington event was probably only at most twice as big as storms that have occurred, say, since 1950, which doesn't sound that scary. You know, the, the, the biggest event we've had since 1950 was 1989, March of 1989. There was a storm that caused a blackout in much of Quebec. Uh, it destroyed a couple of transformers. But within about 12 hours, the power was restored. It was hardly a catastrophic event. Mm -hmm. So 12 hours of power loss in one part of Canada you know, if we then double storm strength, should we expect a totally different level of impact? I would cautiously say that that seems unlikely. Uh, another confusion was that because there's a lot of turbulence, if you imagine um, looking at the ocean during a storm, you can see ordinary waves, but then if you look at any individual wave, you'll see smaller ripples and so on. It's kind of fractal. I think that's a good visual metaphor for what happens when these storms hits. There's a huge amount of um, local spiking, and it's very tempting to say, well, the largest spike that the largest uh, spike in uh, magnetic field that we saw anywhere on the Earth that was measured is X. So now let's assume that a storm could cause X everywhere at once, mm -hmm. and that's not an appropriate extrapolation. It's like assuming, imagining that every place is as high as Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of fallacy was embedded in some of the most most scary analysis. Um, my overall take was that if we extrapolate from the historical record, which is short and shouldn't be over relied upon, that the chance of event of an event as big as um, the Carrington event of 1859 recurring was about zero to four percent per decade. The one caveat I would offer, which and as I say, that event in itself didn't seem doesn't seem to be so scary because it's twice as big as events that civilization shrugged off very easily. I think the biggest caveat is that I learned about some research just as I was finishing up that looked at tree rings from trees in Japan, I think, and found that there was a very sharp jump. Oh, I'm going to forget. I think it was probably in an isotope of carbon dioxide, but I'm not 100% sure, in the tree rings uh, between a couple years in the 700s, I'm going by the Western calendar, and again in the 900s. So it's more than 1,000 years ago. And the best explanation for those giant jumps is uh, apparently uh, extraterrestrial radiation, conceivably from another galaxy or another star, but probably more likely our own sun. And this would imply this would imply a solar flare, I don't know, 10 or 20 times bigger than anything we've witnessed in modern history. But solar flares are not the same thing as geomagnetic storms. Solar flares are huge outputs of pure radiation. They may be associated 
with ejections of actual coronal matter, which is what we're concerned about. But that association is not well understood. And in particular, it's not clear whether a solar flare 10 times as big as anything we've witnessed in modernity would lead to geomagnetic storms 10 times as big. Just so that I understand the engineering aspect, is it that the transmission lines are very long, so they kind of pick up a lot of the, the magnetic change? And so like the longer the cable, like the worse it is? That's right. Changing magnetic fields. If, 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 you're in a, if you're in a particular spot and the magnetic field around you is, is varying, that induces a voltage where you are. This is one of the principles that makes motor works, motors work and generators. We measure electric fields in volts per meter or volts per kilometer. So if you have a wire that is running many, many kilometers and it's, and it's immersed in this very strong electric field, then yes, that will multiply the effect and induce a larger current. Your question about the engineering though, reminds me of another interesting theme in this. One voice in this discussion that is, uh, is uh, some engineers at ABB, Asia Brown Bavaria, I think it is, um, which makes a lot of, of these big transformers. And I think because of mergers is now sort of retroactively, retroactively the maker of the majority of transformers in the United States. Some engineers there have put out papers saying there's really nothing to worry about. And we have to take what they say with a grain of salt because they're basically saying our products are great. Wouldn't they want to say our products will break, you need spares? Yeah, you'd think that. Uh, <laughs> um, but I guess it cuts both ways. I, I don't know. I remember testing that idea. I don't know. I think maybe if they say that Everyone's transformers are bad. Yeah, if you take, admit your products are bad, obviously, then that may pe push people to go to the competitor. Yeah. Can, maybe the competitor keeps its lips tight. So anyway, uh, we need to take what they say with a grain of salt, especially because they're using models that they won't share. So they make claims that we've done simulations and everything's fine, but they won't really let anybody else check that. Nevertheless, there, I found there was an interesting argument in what they said that I couldn't dismiss on principle. Electrical power grids have all sorts of components that are designed to regulate the waveform of the power, the exact frequency, keep the waveforms from different generators in sync, uh, all sorts of machinery to keep this very complicated thing working just right with extraordinary precision over large areas. Or if they can't do that, to shut the system down. So what they're saying is that if there's a big geomagnetic storm, it has two main effects. One that is almost instantaneously starts disrupting the flow of current and the waveform of the current. The other is that over the scale of say 20 minutes, it will start to pour energy into transformers and heat them up, causing damage. But those are two different time scales, you know, milliseconds and minutes. And they're saying that there's a lot of safety equipment in place that will automatically shut the grid down if things get too disrupted. And so the result could be a very large and quick blackout, but it actually preserves, protects the system. So in short-term fragility comes long-term resilience. Uh, so what we may have to, have to actually worry about more is not the really massive events, but smaller events that damage transformers, but don't disrupt the power flows enough to trigger the safety mechanisms. And there's some actual evidence that that's happened, for example, in South Africa, which is um, closer to the equator and therefore doesn't experience the storms as strongly. So that if there were a big storm, maybe the, the longest term damage would actually be in the places that are closer to the equator, or less affected by it. And what would happen is over, say, the next year or so, a lot of their transformers would um, shut down which to me doesn't sound like an existential risk. So is it, is it the entire transformer that gets broken, or is it just some piece that we can stockpile and then replace later on? Well, now you're pushing, I don't really know that well. My, my intuition is you know, the damage can be pretty severe. Um, I mean, mean, is it an explosion? Is it it's getting hot and breaking? Apparently there have been explosions, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the key components of a transformer are a magnetic core and then lots and lots of wire wrapped around it. And then it's immersed usually in oil for cooling purposes. And so when these things overheat, you can, I suppose the cores, the actual magnetic cores are not that harmed, mm -hmm. but all the wires, their insulation can get burned. They get, the wires can melt together. The oil can catch fire or absorb impurities. Sounds like a pretty big repair job. Uh, so what was the biggest challenge uh, with this, with this research project? The interdisciplinary nature of it. I mean, I studied a bit of about electronics when I was a kid. So I had some background and some understanding of you know, how electricity and magnetism are connected together. But I was, cer I was certainly out of my depth and going beyond those basics or trying to understand solar physics or what have you. And so it was a, trying to understand enough of the literature that I could say the kinds of make the kinds of summary statements I'm making to you 
or even engage in conversations with the guys who actually knew the stuff, which I did. Even the, even that, you need a certain level of understanding. Did you have to uh, learn or maybe even invent some some new methods to, to reach a good conclusion? No, I didn't invent anything new, although it was another case of my wanting to implement a particular method to do the statistical extrapolation that wasn't easily done in Stata, which is the statistics software that I know. So I ended up writing a program and going beyond just what I needed, writing a general purpose program that is now shared and ultimately um, getting very immersed in one particular technical question about how to construct um, confidence intervals, which led to an obscure and separate academic paper. So I thought you'd say that the, the biggest challenge was that there just aren't many historical events. So it's hard to know what, what's the likelihood of, would of an extreme event going forward when we just haven't, well, like we're trying to predict the, the frequency of something that's never happened, or at least not, uh, not in the last few hundred years. Uh, how did you get around that, that issue? Um, I would say that I did not get around it. I did the best with the modern observatory data that's, you know, observed every hour and provides the basis for good statistical analysis. And then I zoomed out and acknowledged that there are longer term dynamics, which remind us that we, we, there's a lot that we don't understand and things could change more than the, the brief historical record that we have would suggest. You know, it, the, the, the question ultimately is what should we do? That's the important question. You don't have to have complete understanding of the underlying real, physical reality in order to, answer, to come up with a good answer for that question. My answer was that we shouldn't panic, that there is some exaggeration here, but Despite my more reassuring conclusions based on limited data, we can't rule out some serious tail risk. And there's a real opportunity here to improve our knowledge. Would it be expensive? Uh, compared to the stakes, no. Whether Open Phil would consider it to be expensive, maybe. It's not cheap. If, what you really want to do, like to understand better how transformers are affected by these storms, is you want to have an actual full size transformer supplying, shall we say, a small city and then being inundated with these additional uh, large and, and volatile currents. But there aren't a lot of spare small cities around. You know, it's that, that it, you can easily, you know, I would imagine, run into ten, tens of millions of dollars to run realistic field experiments. Now, if you're concerned about the fate of the global economy, that's nothing. Uh, the question uh, it might be daunting for, for even for open for philanthropy. So you mentioned kind of the, the fat tailness of the, of the distribution. I guess we have a, a reasonable sense of the frequency of kind of common, probably small uh, geomagnetic storms. Can, can we then kind of extrapolate just saying, well, it's well, it's not going to be a normal distribution, but it'll be a power law or something like that. And, and from that, we can figure out the, the frequency of uh, something that's never happened before. Yeah, that's an idea that I, I, I develop in my report. Probably a lot of your listeners are familiar with at least the rough idea of the central limit theorem in statistics. This is a really key result that says that, uh, for example, if you were to conduct the same presidential poll at uh, the same moment in time, and you did, maybe you did that poll a thousand times, you would get a slightly different answer uh, each time, each run of the poll, but your answers would cluster around the true value, and they would do so in a pattern that follows a bell curve, what's also called the normal curve. And that's true regardless of the actual underlying distribution of views in the world. And almost every case uh, we can imagine, you get a bell curve when you repeatedly sample. And that's a really powerful result because it means you can um, start to construct confidence intervals while remaining ignorant of the underlying distributions of the things you're studying. And we can do something similar when we're looking at extreme events. It turns out that you know, we don't know what the, statist the true statistical distribution of, of mag geomagnetic storms is. Some people have argued that it's kind of a power law or something else. Turns out that when you look at the tail of a distribution, you know, the way it's sort of gradually coming down to zero and flattening out, most tails are the same. That is to say, they fall within a single family of distributions. It's called the generalized Pareto family. They vary in, you know, whether they actually hit zero or not and how fast they decay towards zero. But they kind of look the same, regardless of what the rest of the distribution looks like. So what you can do is you can take a data set like all geomagnetic disturbances since 1957, and then look at the, so I would say, like 300 biggest ones. That's the right tail of the distribution. And then ask which member of the generalized Pareto family fits that data the best. And then once you've got a curve that you have, you know, for theoretical reasons is a good choice, you can extrapolate it farther to the right 
and say, what's, what's, what's a million year storm look like? Mm. And one always has to be careful about uh, out of sample extrapolations. Mm. But I think it's more grounded in theory. This is to use the generalized Pareto family because it is analogous to using the normal f- family when constructing usual uh, standard errors. Then to, for example, assume that geomagnetic storms follow a power law, which was done in one of the pack papers that reached the popular press. So there was a Washington Post story some years ago that said the chance of a Carrington-sized storm was like 12% per decade. But that was assuming a power law, which has a very fat tail. And when I looked at the data, I just felt that that uh, and allowed the data to choose within a larger and theoretically motivated family. Uh, it did not, the, the, the model fit did not gravitate towards the power law. Is kind of a log normal or normal curve a power law? Are they all special cases of this generalized family? Their tails are. Okay, like tails. If you were, like, you know, if you take like the rightmost 1% or the rightmost 10th of percent, they will more and more closely approximate a member of this one particular family. How much do you rely on interviews with experts uh, in, in your research in general? I don't rely on, rely on them as much as I would say my colleagues do when doing other work that is published at OpenFill. There's a lot of interviews that are done here and then the, the notes are printed up and so on. But I do very much value when I get to a certain point and I think I've got a new understanding of some question, but I'm not confident in it yet because I'm new to the field and the ideas are new to me. I love being able at that point to call up an author and test my understanding. And very often, you know, my understanding gets reversed or I get pointed in new directions. Why don't you think OpenFill has given many grants to, to deal with geomagnetic storms? I should know the answer to that. I think the decision was made when I was still on a consulting basis here. And so I was on the outside. Uh, and so I'm not sure. We have made one grant uh, to a researcher whose work I've mentioned before in South Africa. But that was not part of a systematic effort to take on this area. I think probably people became convinced that other ex- existential risks looked bigger. We're doing a lot of work on, you know, um, pandemic preparedness and bioterrorism preparedness. And also we're looking at AI safety and a couple other areas. I guess one thing is that uh, a geomagnetic storm wouldn't affect the whole globe all at once, right? It would just affect some part of the Earth. That's, that's a good point, yeah. It doesn't literally seem to represent an existential risk. Certainly a catastrophic risk, but... Are there any careers you'd like to encourage anyone to, to go and work on in this area? Well, if you have an aptitude uh, for engineering, yeah, we, we definitely need more uh, research because I just think there isn't much attention being paid to this. And the, the stakes are potentially quite large. All right, let's move on from the geomagnetic storms to talking about research you did on the impact of deworming, trying to figure out whether it really does improve uh, child health and test scores and things like that. That's been like quite a source of controversy, as informally known as the, the worm wars. What did your analysis uh, add to all of that? Uh, over the course of, I think, a, well, a year and a half or so, I replicated and reconstructed most of the studies that look on the look at the long-term impacts of deworming. So we're talking about you know, distributing pills primarily in schools to all kids, whether or not they have, have worms, because it's just cheaper to give them. And then they, we believe the side effects are essentially zero. Uh, and without without actually testing whether they've got worms. Um, and doing that, say, twice a year in areas where worms are endemic. There are lots of studies of the short-term impacts on body weight, height, these kinds of things, within, say, 6 to 12 months, but many fewer of the long-term impacts. But for our cost-benefit analysis and thinking about whether to recommend deworming charities, of course, the long-term matters a lot. You know, effects over 10 years are 10 times as important as, important as effects over one and there we've only got four or five studies. And so I've looked at most of those, not all yet. The big story is that I have undercut a couple of studies, but not the key one that has brought the most attention to this intervention and that we have been using in our cost effectiveness analysis. So 20 years ago, Ted Miguel and Michael Kramer co-authored a paper called Worms. They were economists, so it was in the economic literature which was based on an experiment run in Western Kenya of deworming. And they looked initially at short-term impacts, as you might expect. And they found that the dewormed kids uh, went to school more. I don't think their test scores improved, but school attendance jumped. And then they got more funding to follow up longer term on the same kids. And they're continuing to do that. And I think we're providing some funding for that. And that's really fantastic to be able to see the effects 10, 15 years out. And so one of the longer-term studies, I think, it goes out about 
maybe not quite 10 years, has been the key one in our cost effectiveness analysis that you can find on our website. So it's a follow-up on the original experiment. And the key question is, can we trust the original experiment? You know, was it a proper, a clean experiment? And I tried really hard to take it apart, you know, to attack it. But in the end, I had to concede that the study won. One concern was that it wasn't actually a randomized study. There were 75 schools in the study, and they sorted them by, I think, province and then district, and then by the number of kids in the school. So they had this like sorted spreadsheet in Excel. And then having sorted them, they numbered them. There were actually, actually three, it wasn't a two-way experiment, it was a three-way experiment. Some kids immediately got deworming, some kids it was delayed a year, and some kids it was delayed until the experiment was over. So then they numbered the list, one, two, three, one, two, three, right down. And that was how they assigned the groups. So they were assigning in part on how many kids were in school, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is a little bit worrisome. And it wasn't randomization. And so I tried to look at, you know, is there any kind of what's called statistical imbalance? Do these groups look statistically different? And I even went so far as to figure out exactly where these schools were using some data that they accidentally made it viewable on the internet and didn't want me to, to see, in which I kept confidential. Figured out their exact locations and then use that along with Google Maps to figure out their elevations, which is actually important because elevation has a lot to do with how much um, how bad the worm problem is where you are. Higher elevations are going to have less of it because they don't flood as much, basically. So I had a new variable that was external to the study, and then I could look at whether these three groups uh, were statistically the same on this variable that was not something that the, that the uh, authors could have manipulated their results with, with awareness of. And I had to concede that uh, even here, there really just wasn't uh, much sign of um, imbalance. So I um, came away more or less saying I had to agree, believe in, in, in the worm study and in the follow-ups that we use. However, there's been a few other studies. Well, I'll talk about one other study that was also reinforcing our faith in deworming, which I have now come to strongly question. It uh, was not randomized. I think I mentioned it already. In fact, it's by Hoyt Blakely of uh, deworming in the American South. The reason it was compelling was that he seemed to show some very sharp jumps over time in uh, schooling rates, of kids after the after the campaign, and then also when they reached adulthood, he showed him to show some nicely and um, sharply timed increases in their earnings, and that lined up really well with the research from Kenya, where we saw the same thing: higher school attendance quit right away, and higher earnings long term. And uh, the particular way that it was done with with this kind of seeming sharp jumps also made it con- pretty convincing, even though it wasn't a randomized experiment. But with a lot of research assistance, I rebuilt the original data, census data. And actually, there's data from other sources as well. Big project because he took a lot of data from 100-year-old books and had to be typed in manually. And there's one data point for each county in, in the south, like a thousand counties. A lot of work to pull the data together. And I, in my closest replication, I just didn't see uh, a clear sign of a, of a sharp jump appeared consistently through the different runs. And then when we expanded the data set, because um, more and more census data is being digitized, like so maybe he had only a, I don't know, 1% sample for 1910, now we have a 100% sample. When I expanded the data, any suggestion of a sharp jump where we would expect it if if the campaign was the cause uh, was further smoothed out. And so what it looks like is that there was long-term convergence uh, both within the South and between the South and the rest of the country on outcomes such as amount of time spent in school and adult earnings, but nothing, no sudden sh- jumps that would be easily attributable to the, the deworming campaign. So how did you get the data you needed to, to do these replications? Uh, in that case, it was uh, hard work of, I did some of it and research assistants did uh, other parts of it, of hunting down old books. Some of them were in Google Books. Some of them we're in my neighborhood library, which is the Library of Congress, <laughs> which is very fortunate. And we just had to scan, photograph, type in, do error checking where we could. Uh, and then the census data comes from a fantastic project called IPUMS, I-P-U-M-S, which is, I won't try to figure out what it stands for, where they are digitizing more and more census data, not only from the United States, but from other countries. And, you, and providing a really great interface that allows you to choose the 
the years you want and the variables you want and download it. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's all built, brought together in a, a Microsoft S, a SQL Server database. And then from there, once, once the uh, actual data tables that we need for analysis are synthesized, that is then exported to Stata for analysis. So it sounds like GiveWell's support of deworming then like falls mostly on just one paper from the 90s. Uh, it sounds concerning, right? <laughs> yeah, I worry about it. What's happened as a result of my scrutiny is that our research base, which seemed kind of reassuring, I haven't, I haven't talked about all the studies, there are two or three others, uh, has thinned. And so we're basically relying on this one experiment in Western Kenya. And the question is, what do you do with that, right? I th my impression is that in the public health world, world of medicine, you, you erect certain threshold tests. And so you say one study is not enough or you know, p-value on the study is not below 0.05, therefore we reject it completely. Uh, so we've, we've gotten into some you know, debates with people who come out of public health, especially in the UK, who just think we're crazy. How can you recommend uh, this intervention if you've got one study that's saying it's got positive effects and others that say it's indistinguishable from zero? I think a, f a correct formal answer, I'm not sure if it's ultimately practical, is to, that we need to be Bayesian about it. We're in a situation where indisputably the evidence is weak. I think the definition of weak, weak evidence is that your priors matter. Right? If the evidence were compelling, it almost wouldn't matter what we thought before we came into the experiment. And we're not in that situation. But suppose we draw some bell curves representing our general, represent, our general understanding of the impact of deworming. For the worm study in Western Kenya, that bell curve would be to the right of zero. A little bit of what the tail would be on the left of zero, which would mean it's got probably got a positive impact. And then we could combine that with the other studies that are producing bell curves that are centered around zero. And then we might bring in our own prior based on what we know about the benefits of, of childhood interventions generally from other research that's not about deworming. And then we could fuse that together. And we might get an overall estimate represented by a bell curve with, with, you know, with, this, with some spread rep to represent our uncertainty, which, who knows, you know, might have 20% or 30% of its weight to the left of zero, depending on how you do it. There's a bazillion ways to do it. And so we would say... Our best central estimate is that this is doing good, but we're not hyper-confident of it. And that's an uncomfortable position to be in, but if we're true expectation maximizers, if we're being rational about this, then we should still favor the intervention. Uh, have you scrutinized the, the experiments that find that there's not much impact and uh, like come up with any possible explanations for, for why that's the outcome? I'm not aware of long-term studies that didn't find much impact as originally published. Now, maybe there's some publication bias there. A couple of them, because of my scrutiny, I now read to be saying that. There are lots of short-term studies that find little impact, and now I've not looked at those. Did you get a lot of people to, to check your work, given how contentious this, this question has been? Not a lot. However, I always send it to the original authors, and all the data and code are posted online. So I hope that people are getting into it, at least the, have the opportunity to do so. If your conclusion uh, about deworming is wrong, what do you think will be the, the most likely reason? And I guess in this case, wrong would be that it's like clearly good or clearly bad. I think the thing that I worry about most is that there's some kind of selection bias. Like maybe there are 10 plausibly good interventions out there that are like deworming and all have been the focus of similar research. And just by chance, this is the one that got the nice p-value in the original study. Or to be more precise about it, maybe just by chance there was some true imbalance in the original experiment, which can happen. And that that's generating all these results. And so then we're gravitating to the one thing that just by chance is looking good. That's what I worry about. Why do you think this question has, has been so contentious? And uh, like, why don't people mostly agree with you that kind of it's there's, with low confidence we can say it's, kind of, it's maybe positive? Yeah, it's a good question. I think part of it is because it's been studied by people in two different tribes health and economics. And they bring to it different priors about, you know, standards of evidence, uh, which, which maybe can be viewed as different Bayesian priors. And those priors seem so right to them that they can't understand the other side. It reminds me of, you know, I've been doing reading, on, reading recently on moral psychology, you know, by a book by Joshua Green, where he talks about how we're evolved for cooperation within tribes in order to compete with other tribes. And one of the problems is that 
different tribes have different concepts of what is right and wrong and cannot see eye to eye no matter how hard they try. So is the issue here that, that the medical tribe uh, is just more skeptical that, that any treatments work? Maybe so. Uh, I try to give them the benefit of the doubt and imagine that their norms are evolved for a world in which powerful medicines typically do have side effects, in which research may be funded by drug companies and need, therefore needs added skepticism. It may be part of that. So do you think well, were people convinced by, by what you wrote? Are we getting close to like the last word, at least on these like old papers? Uh, I know for a fact that the, the leading public health skeptics of, of deworming uh, were not convinced by what I wrote. I, I really would like to try to do some, I, I feel the impulse to do some kind of formal Bayesian analysis like I described. Let's state a prior, let's synthesize the evidence from that we have from different sources, including the stuff that says it's indistinguishable from zero. Let's come up with our best, est- best estimate for, for a distribution. Let's not impose a senseless 0.05 test since that's arbitrary. And let's ask ourselves what looks more likely that it's, that it's, harm- that it's helpful or not. How hard is that to do? That's a good question. I had a conversation just a couple days ago with uh, Ozzy Gouin, if I'm saying his name right, um, who created Guestimate, yeah. which is a wonderful tool for trying to do computations and explicitly represent your uncertainty. And it was motivated by exactly this. Can we use his tool or add to it or create some other kind of tool so that we could articulate some of these ideas better than we're currently doing with our cost-effectiveness analysis in um, Google Sheets. It's tough because it can require a lot of number crunching power just to to do simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, and capture the uncertainty. And at the same time, we don't want to create a black box because one thing we really like about Google Sheets is that everybody can see what we're doing. And good coders are expensive. So it's it's not sure not clear to me exactly what we'll pull off. I'm hoping we can do something. Let's uh, zoom out and talk perhaps about like academia and research reliability in general. So most listeners will be kind of well aware of criticisms of um, research that's done in the social sciences and universities. You know, publication bias, p hacking, and and so on. I guess you've got a lot of experience trying to get reliable conclusions in spite of all of these issues. Um, do you think these problems are kind of overrated, appropriately rated, or or underrated in terms of their magnitude? I think as a group, they are a big concern. As I think I said earlier, I have found that pure replicability has not been a big issue, which is something that's sometimes emphasized. But when I look more closely than a normal peer reviewer looks, uh, I often find problems. And about 50% of the time, in a very small sample of my history, I've ended up questioning the conclusions. And I've wondered um, what should be done about this. Uh, because I think a way of putting it is that the level of review that a published paper has to go through in order to get published is not optimal from a social point of view, a societal point of view. I think it's too easy to get published. Yeah. You know, if you think about what is the value of the reviewer's time that goes into looking at a paper, a top journal, maybe three reviewers look at it for a couple hours, whatever. So that's going to be, you know, measured as a four-figure sum, maybe $1,000, $5,000. But a paper, in principle, could have implications measured in billions or trillions of dollars. And that doesn't seem optimal, given what we know about the potential unreliability. But it also doesn't seem realistic to expect publishers of journals to be investing 10 times more in review. I mean, I'm assuming their margins are pretty tight and they just can't do that. So the question is, if this is societally valuable and they can't afford to do it, who's going to do it? And it might mean that we need new institutions or new kinds of processes outside of academia or inside that are funded by uh, major decision makers. Or maybe he, we give well and open fill or other philanthropies or government agencies need to be more uh, routinely funding this kind of scrutiny of published research before, research before using it. It seems like even a bigger problem than the money is the fact that from an academic's point of view, if they're peer reviewing papers, they're not publishing and their career's not moving ahead and they, they run the risk of getting fired, basically. You can't build a career out of doing peer review, I can't imagine. That's that's exactly right. So that's a disincentive within academia to invest much in review. That's absolutely right. I actually don't really understand why they spend so much time doing it, given that it seems like there's very little reward. If, if a particular paper overlaps well enough with a person's interests, they're still going to be they're probably going to be passionate about supporting it or, or disagreeing with it or what have you. you know? yeah. Most academics are passionate about what they do and that you know, that yeah. carries over. 
Do you think research reliability is getting better as people become more concerned about these issues? Or at least, I mean, I don't know whether they actually are becoming more concerned about these issues, but I, but I perceive that there's more talk about it than there used to be. I mean, I guess my empirical answer would be that I don't know. Hmm. I, don't have, I don't have enough data with a time trend. There absolutely is a trend towards requiring data and code for studies to be, pu- to be posted publicly. And pre-registration, and, at least in medicine. Yeah, and pre-registration is starting to happen. That's influenced me. And I think that those are, are uh, good trends. There's, it's, it's, they're far from universal. Uh, something I've recently come to appreciate, actually doing the uh, reconstructing the uh, Blakely hookworm study that we talked about before, is that it's one thing to post the data that you fed into your statistical analysis. It's quite another to post the raw data that you collected from many sources. Because that data gets processed, and rearranged, aggregated, what have you. And that is, it's much more rare to see that be made available. But the processing that you go, you apply to go from the raw data to the data that you feed into the analysis actually is analysis mm. and can contain problems or, you know, hide issues, what have you. And so it also should be scrutinized. Do you have any other ideas uh, outside of peer review for making research more reliable? It seems like especially the incentives that get hard uh, to get right here. There may be things that a funder could do, you know, to create fellowships and awards for the kind of work that we would like to see. Uh, small things like that that help to try to generate momentum in a field. What about people doing careers and kind of being data vigilantes where they, they do what you do whenever they see a paper that they think is getting media attention but they don't really believe and then kind of make a splash by saying, no, actually, this is this is wrong and perhaps putting a bit of fear into uh, paper publishers that if, if they write something too dodgy, they're going to get called out. Yeah, I share the spirit. I, I hope that they will pre-register and publish whether or not they find that they have a gotcha finding. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and if they find they can make a career of it, uh, that's good. I, I argued before. My, my impression is it's hard to do that because you you alienate you can alienate a lot of people whose friendship and support you may need at some point. And if there's anybody really good at that, I, I, I'd like to meet them because I could use some help here. <laughs> uh, I guess that's one reason why these people often seem to be outside of the fields that they're criticizing. People yeah. who've gotten statistical training elsewhere and then they... Uh, yeah. Like this psychology thing, I don't believe yeah. that. I mean, I should say, I think there are ways of being a critic there. You can minimize the degree to which you piss people off. It depends on how you write, how you handle yourself. Uh, so what are you researching at OpenPhil these days? Are you working on a new replication or something else? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should mention, I just feel like for completeness, after I did the Blakely hookworm paper, I also did the Blakely malaria eradication paper. He used similar methods similar data sets, he found that after malaria eradication campaigns in the United States in the 1920s, in Brazil and Colombia and Mexico in the 1950s, there were significant gains long-term for people's earnings, for people who came from malaria endemic regions. And those results mostly stood up under my replication. I think it's appropriate for me to mention that not only not only did I under, undercut one study, but I mostly validated another. Yeah. So that's my most recent replication We've submitted versions of those to journals, and there's versions in the public domain. Now I've switched to something quite different, which I'm really enjoying, and it's all very preliminary, so I don't feel like I can speak about it very wisely. Uh, We are having some good discussions internally, just trying to really think through the key logic behind our choices of what to fund, what we call cause prioritization. Uh, I think we're up at about the $200 million per year level now, and could very well go higher, you know, given the scale of, of Dustin Moskovitz's and Kerry Tuna's fortune. But that's that when we, if, if and when we do scale up, that really means that we're no longer in pilot mode. We really got to make some firm decisions about how much we want to put into catastrophic risks versus give directly versus whatever versus animal welfare. And so we're having some nice internal discussions about that, which I had never been very involved with, but. I am now trying to uh, participate in more, which is leading me to listen to a lot of your pad- podcasts. I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I've been thinking more about moral philosophy than I ever have before. I listen to Nick Beckstead and Will McCaskill and uh, to- Toby Ord. So I'm, th- I'm thinking about these kinds of philosophical questions of how much you weigh animals versus people in the far future versus the present. And then I think we'll shift pretty soon to trying to do a critical review of the AI safety question. You know, what's a, that's a b- big potential focus for us is trying to minimize the, the harm from artificial intelligence. 
you think your, your training in, I guess, more concrete empirical work uh, helps you very much in, with, with, with this question? Uh, not a lot, no. <laughs> it, it's, it's a general, I mean, of course, there are stylistic similarities in whatever I do. I want to dig down deep. Um, if somebody cites, you know, Hume, then I want to go read a bit of Hume and uh, I want to hear different views and try to synthesize. And I am also bringing in Occam's razor where I can to try to, you know, find the simplest way of reconciling the different things, uh, ideas. So do you think OpenPhil and the Effective Altruism community have in general been focusing on the on the right areas? Or I guess if you were running the show, might you uh, have done things differently? I, I don't have an answer to that yet. It's, it's too preliminary. Too early. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what do you make of Effective Altruism in, in general? Mm. I'm a bit guarded by the label, about, about the label and the, the phenomenon. I don't consider myself an EA. I think maybe, maybe unfairly I'm put off by a literal reading of the term. Effective altruism it seems presumptuous to assert that what you do is effective and implies that what other people are doing is not effective. And that creates a lot of antibodies. And especially given how young most EAs are, it comes off as a kind of a, a young Turk thing. You know, it can feel a bit arrogant. We figured it out. I'm very much in favor of empiricism. That might be the one ism that I subscribe to. And uh, I think it's fantastic that there's a whole movement mostly of young people who are thinking really hard, rigorously, and in a self-challenging way about what they can do with their lives and how they can do the most good. It's absolutely fantastic. Labels aside. I do sometimes worry that there's more intelligence than wisdom in the movement. You know, I'm not even sure if I can articulate that further, but maybe you know what I mean. It's uh, well, a lot of potential, but maybe not a lot of experience. Yeah, I just, you know, whatever wisdom is, it comes from exposing yourself to lots of different thought domains and ways of thinking and problems and with openness and humility, you know, ready to question whether you're the particular kinds of uh, particular analytical tools that you've taken on will still work when you move to a new area. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up the uh, kind of presumptuousness or arrogance of the term effective altruist. The people who have uh, worried about that from the from the very beginning, I guess, in 2012, and uh, have tried to push uh, aspiring effective altruist or like a member of the effective altruism community uh, to be like to, to not presume that in fact you are being effective. But uh, they have more syllables, so uh, yeah. they tend to just like never really take off. The, the shortest term yeah. uh, usually wins, yeah. um, even if it's less accurate or more annoying. Yeah. So how can other people develop research skills like yours, uh, particularly, I guess, if they're working on their own, perhaps they've already graduated and, and they're trying to pick these skills up later? Well, I would say that just because uh, I did it without going through a degree program, that doesn't mean you have to do it that way. If you know in advance that's what you want to do, great. Maybe I already said that. You need to have a foundation in statistics, and if not that, mathematics. I have found that replicating existing work is a great way to learn stuff. And there are more and more studies that you can download and whose data and code you can download and start playing with. And then you need to be ready to, to read the help manual. And when you hit something that you don't understand, recognize that and stop and then figure out how you're going to educate yourself about a key idea when, when it seems essential. And then Wikipedia can help and it can you can follow the notes in Wikipedia to sources. And it's an iterative process. You can also take classes. I'm, I'm sure there are lots of classes and that stuff. I mean, more broadly, this just reminds me of another very fundamental thought doesn't really answer your question, which is, you know, I do sometimes get asked, what should I study in school? And I have come to the view that to the extent that you can manage it, that it feels true to who you are, it is better to study technical subjects. Uh, maybe that contradicts what I said before about acquiring wisdom. But school, at least in the United States, can be terribly expensive. Uh, and it's not always clear what you're getting from it, but sometimes what you can get that it, it can be hard to duplicate without being in a formal program is just the discipline that's imposed upon you to learn to pick up a technical skill because you're going to be tested. Whereas I feel like you can always read history and literature on your own, not to mention historical analysis and literary criticism. Yeah, it's interesting. What Why is it that that's easier to do later on? I guess is it just more engaging to most people to read history than to do maths themselves? Well, it might get, it might get to the slow brain, fast brain distinction, you know. We're pretty well wired to hear stories comes very naturally to us. And history and literature are a little bit like that. We're not wired, most of us, to code or do mathematics. And so that's our slow brains. And it's hard work. And sometimes we need the discipline of a structured program to push us along and start to automate some of those skills. Yeah. Do you think you can learn most of what you need to know by doing this work on your own? Or does it, does it add a lot to be part of an institution other than a university? I mean, like, you know, working in open field, obviously you have lots of smart people around you. You can... You can uh, 
run things past them and potentially learn a lot faster? Uh, I work pretty solitarily, so I don't learn much about the technical stuff from my coworkers. But I do get inspiration and motivation, which is probably essential. It's one thing for me to say, I'll go replicate a study. It's another thing for me to be in the privileged position of feeling useful, knowing that what I come up with is, is, is wanted. And that really helps me push ahead. What kind of subfields of statistics do you think are, are most useful for, for people to learn and perhaps underrated that, that not, not enough people dive into them? You know, it's cha- the field is changing. So it seems like in the last five or 10 years, there's been a lot of influence coming in from big data and machine learning. So there's a new set of techniques, that the kinds of things that are used to analyze what makes you click in an email or not are now being transferred to, to economics to analyze very large data sets. So probably that's part of the cutting edge that you'd want to be on top of. My self-education in Bayesian analysis has been pretty ad hoc and ragtag, and I probably would would have benefited from a more systematic introduction to that. And that seems like a good thing to get on top, top of, partly because those techniques are increasingly useful and practical, partly because it gives you a broader understanding of what you're actually doing whenever you do statistics. Is that kind of big data science used that much in social science? Or is it still kind of classical statistics a lot of the time? Classically, you can never have more uh, parameters that you're trying to estimate in your model than you have data points. Because uh, then there's an infinite number of possible and perfect solutions of your m- perfect matches between your model and the data. But there are modern techniques that will try to push all of your parameters towards zero, except the ones that seem to be most relevant. So you can actually have more potential explanatories than you have factors. You can throw lots and lots of things in and then ask it to find a model that balances explanatory power with parsimony. To That's avoid overfitting. Way. Yeah. And that comes out of big data, as far as I understand. Are they good enough at avoiding overfitting? Uh, I mean, I, I learned the old methods, so like hearing about that just like makes a sense, shivers up my spine. I don't have personal experience with them, so I don't know. Okay. Um, I've looked, I've read a bit about the methods and they, they seem appealing to me. They're fairly elegant. Yeah. I mean, I guess if they're using it to like design websites and stuff, you'd think they've yeah. got a pretty good idea. And they would, they'd be able to even test then whether the methods are working. That's right. What about learning to use Bayesian methods? Are they kind of taking off and have, have you had to learn any, any of those? I think Bayesian methods are becoming more important in econometrics, partly because applying them requires a lot of computational power and, and computers are you know, getting more powerful. And partly it's the influence of, I think, big data applications, which also use them. And so they're, that's starting to influence other, other areas of practice. I've come to understand pretty late um, some of the key Bayesian ideas, and I'm still figuring it out. What I've come to understand is that a classical statistical study doesn't actually do what you want it to do. What we want a study to do is say, given what we observe in the real world, like in our experiment, here is the probability distribution for the impact of deworming. But actually, research doesn't tell you that. It does not go from the data that's out there to the distribution for the impact. It's actually the other way around. It says, what what the research can tell us is, if the impact is zero, here's the probability that we observe the data that we actually do. If the impact is that it increases income 10%, here is a probability that we observe the data that we actually do. So the the arrow of the logical arrow there is going from possible values of the true impact to a distribution for the data. It's backwards from what we want. One of my one of my colleagues asked me recently, oh, what if I like speak to this many people and I get this number of people who report that they could change their career plans? Like, uh, what will be the distribution of the probability of like changing someone's careers uh, each in, in each instance i was like well i can tell you this other useless yeah. thing <laughs> but i can't tell you the obvious thing that you're like asking me or like i, I could but it would be a lot of work yes yeah. yes so, so we get likelihood functions as they're as they're called and to go from a likelihood function to what we actually want which is the other way as bayes shows and bayes law is that you need a prior you need to make some assumption a priori which could come from other evidence about the distribution of the thing you're actually interested in and um, that's an important understanding of how of the nature of reasoning with statistics. And it matters more when the evidence is weak. Are there any specific textbooks or other resources that you particularly recommend to young people who are trying to get into similar, similar work? All I can say is I've never read a textbook from front to back. There's some really excellent, rigorous ones, beautiful, elegant statements of all the theory. But I've learned by taking specific papers, struggling to understand them, going to the textbook to read just about whatever technique is being used, going back, trying to implement, etc. It's an iterative exploratory process. There's a lot to be said for learning stuff when you need to know it. 
What about the non-statistical and non-mathematical issues? So when you're replicating a project, this, like you could do a different statistical approach, or maybe there's been a conceptual uh, error in, in how things are being approached, like like with the case of the recidivism of uh, early parolees. That's not a mathematical like finding. That's because you understand the actual real-world case that these numbers are describing. Uh, how did you learn to get good at, at that kind of work? I think most of those insights emerged out of skeptical probing of the data. So if I get a study that's showing a really statistically significant result, and I'm able to reconstruct that result, what I then like to do is strip it down. So if there are 10 control variables, I see what happens if I can I drop the controls. If data come from 100 countries, I see what happens if I can narrow it down just to 30. I try to isolate where it's coming from in the most simple way possible, and then I graph it. And that allows me to like get down to the bedrock of what the actual statistical pattern is and visualize it. And I have found that sometimes when I try to really drill down, I discover things that lead to alternative explanations. Um, that's it's hard for me to provide the details, but that's kind of what happened with the parole bias story. I got a core graph showing that there was just this really strong negative association over time between how long people were staying, staying, in, staying in prison on average and how quickly they got returned to prison. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed almost mechanical. I think that was the word. It was like, it was like a law of nature almost in, the, in this like, particular data set. Like something else is going it on. It just felt yeah. like it was too good to be true, too yeah. strong. And then I started trying to think about the mechanics of the situation. Mm. So that is an important idea. And I think I think good coders will understand, recognize that too, because it's about when you've got a bug, trying to drill down and make get the most simple reproduction you can of the problem. Figure out what's, what's not relevant. So I've kind of developed this rule of thumb when I'm looking at papers, particularly if I'm just looking at the abstract and the conclusion, uh, to trust them more if the method seems really simple. And like the more that you, they're using some complex statistical method, I'm just like, the more cutting edge it is, the more I'm like, I don't really believe this. Do, do, you, do you endorse that? I do. Yes. One reason that randomized studies can be so powerful, is not just that they're randomized, but that they can be they're so conceptually simple as a result. In, in the simplest case, you've got two groups. One got treated, one didn't. You look at the average for each, and you see which average was higher, roughly speaking. Uh, and my experience has been that black boxes often hide a lot of problems and even, even cause problems. There's other issues as well. It's like if it's a cutting-edge technique, maybe people don't have, know how to do it very well. Maybe there was like a coding error because it's like lots of different steps, that kind of thing. Uh, and it also made you wonder like, why did you have to use such a complex method to get your result? It's like, did you just keep fishing, like using an ever more like complicated method until you got something below 0 0.5? Uh, uh, yeah, I share your concern about, you know, what you might call specification mining. Yeah. I'm less concerned about um, bugs and such, because as I say, in general, when I've managed to reconstruct, I get about the same answer. But I have found problems um, sometimes from complicated methods where the authors don't fully understand what's going on because on sense nobody can it's too complicated that the results will be less less stable than they appear and less scrutable well yes uh, i mean a, a big example in my mind is it used to be before there were randomized studies of the impact of microcredit there was a non-randomized study done of the grameen bank and some other microcredit programs in bangladesh mm. it was extremely clever lots of equations uh it seemed to be very strong it was published in a top journal and with a lot of effort i was able to write a program in stata that would you know redo it and initially made one key error that was causing me to get the exact opposite result. They were showing that microcredit reduced poverty. Mm. I was showing that it increased poverty. I didn't, couldn't figure it out. And there was an error in what I was doing, but the error shouldn't have mattered that much, mm. except that the, the actual estimation process was unstable, which I was actually able to prove eventually once I got a good match. That it was actually like a bimodal distribution. The data were compatible with microcredit reducing poverty and almost as compatible with the theory that microcredit was increasing power. I guess an, an exception to this rule that's simple as good is uh, just an observational epidemiological study of you know people who eat chocolate and don't eat chocolate and then look at their yeah. health outcomes. In a sense, that's very simple. Just like look at the population averages. It's the simplest thing you could do, but it's like garbage. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I guess because you just have to look like yeah, a balance of like complexity versus like understanding what, what methods work in principle and which ones don't. Yeah. Um, you know, oftentimes the complexity is motivated by the fact that you don't have an experiment. And so you know that there's all sorts of potential biases and you're trying to do smart things to remove those sources of bias. Uh, but then that creates opacity. Do you wish you'd done like a uh, formal study beyond your undergraduate degree or maybe, or maybe even gone into academia? Or do you, do you feel like you've done pretty well uh, figuring things out on your own? I can see it both ways. There was a long period in my life from my crisis at Cambridge for more than 10 years after where I knew I had something to offer. I had this Harvard degree, but also felt a lot of self-doubt. 
And that began when I failed all my exams and, you know, worried about how that would look and didn't stay within an established track. And I think if I had known where I was headed, I could have gotten there faster. You know, I could have gotten doing this kind of work faster. That said, if I had gone a conventional track, it might have just literally taken me on a different track. And what I've stumbled into is being able to contribute because I'm different. And I feel very grateful for that. And uh, if I could live my life again, I would be very reluctant to, to risk losing that. Yeah. How much do you think that you're adding value because you're specifically outside of academia, that you don't face the same incentives, you have different incentives, and you don't have to do your own original research. You can instead focus on this replication and, and also like getting actionable like advice that a foundation can use rather than just like having elegant methods. Oh, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. Um, if I were in, in academia, presumably I'd be responding, I'd be facing and responding to different incentives mm -hmm. and would have absorbed a different culture. Do you think more people should be doing what you're doing? Like, is, is the balance out of whack? Absolutely. I don't know of many people who are doing what I do. You just told me about these uh, data, data, data vigilantes. Data vigilantes. It's, it's, a, it's a handful of people. So. Okay. Yeah, I think we need more of it. Um, I mean, that's I'm obviously biased, but it, it's just striking, as I say, to overturn about half the things I look at and realize that we need more serious review if we're going to rely on this stuff for making big, big decisions. How can someone get paid to do this other than working at OpenPhil? Are there other, other funders? I, I think it, it may be hard to establish oneself, uh, but I think that if one is working on policy-relevant stuff, increasingly there ought to be space at think tanks uh, that, are, that are appropriate for whatever area you're interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that there are funders who are interested in the state of research and trying to improve it. And there are more and more journals publishing replications. Uh, so you mentioned think tanks, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. But uh, we've talked here about kind of statistical training. But do you know of any other ways to develop just good holistic judgment? Well, it's a skill that you learn through practice. And so the question is, where can you get a job where you're asked to do it? Uh, I think doing policy analysis, um, whether you're doing it for a government agency or a think tank or a member of Congress, can be really good for that. Because any practical policy question has a dozen dimensions, political ec matters of equity, um, administrative realities. And what's important is to be able to hear out each of those perspectives and then in some way that's unique to each situation, figure out how to move forward. I guess one question is uh, how do you get feedback such that if you've had bad judgment in a case, uh, you know about it. In policy, the feedback loop can be kind of weak. So this is one reason that these like doing these statistical or like doing anything where you like actually get an answer about whether you were right uh, or whether your predictions were correct is, is very good for developing judgment. But those situations can sometimes be rare. That's right. It depends, I think, a bit on what you're trying, what kind of policy you're looking at. If you're working on tax policy, you know, it, it can go up. If you actually succeed in making a change, then it may be 10 years ago before there's any opportunity to change it and the, the effects may be unclear. If you are, I'm thinking of my wife who spent many years working for Medicare and trying to come up with new contractual arrangements with doctors and hospitals to try to change the incentives in the healthcare system. Mm. She could get certain kinds of negative feedback very quickly. For example, if nobody signed up for a program mm. or if you know doctors and hospitals you know just argued vehemently that something was impractical or what have you. Mm. So when you're trying to get other people to do something as part of a, your overall program for change, yeah. you can find out pretty quickly whether you're succeeding in that or not. Yeah, I'm just thinking um, each week I get an email with like new papers from NBER, which I think is the National Bureau of Economic Research. So as I could get someone to kind of take those papers, hide the results, and then like get me to read the rest of it and try to guess what the actual outcome was. And that would be like one way of training your intuitions, like a lot faster than you otherwise would. Or, or like read the introduction and try to figure out what method they use or something like that. Yeah. I like that. Okay, let's come back to think tank careers. So you started your career with uh, nine years at the World Watch Institute. And then I guess you went to Center for Global Development. What are the pros and cons of starting a career in a, in a think tank? The advantages is that you get pretty quickly exposed to an interdisciplinary world. Whatever problem you solve, you, you, you're, you're thinking about, you're going to learn that there are many dimensions and what good ways of thinking about it, historical, um, in terms of justice, uh, in terms of administrative issues, etc. And I can imagine that in academia, you might come to that less naturally because you're the tendency in academia is to narrow your, your center for fo a focus. And 
at least in the United States, I don't know about in Europe, the, the think tank world is pretty fluid. So there are lots of peer organizations and over time you can make connections and, and move and rise and grow in lots of ways. I guess the disadvantage of starting a career there is what I mentioned for myself before. Well, maybe I shouldn't generalize for that. I was, what I was thinking was just that I not only started in think tanks, I stayed there a very long time. And so I was removed from practical decision-making, whether be it in government or philanthropy or business. And I think at some point that began to cost me because I was less inspired about new areas to work in and perhaps um, less able to contribute for lack of understanding of practical realities. Yeah, so nine years is quite a bit longer than most people stay in their first job. So what what motivated you to to stay at just one organization for that long? Well, technically it was my second job. I was the first one was when I followed my girlfriend to Philadelphia. That was a year. Yeah, it was the sense that I was continuing to grow. The pattern at World Watch was that they didn't hire PhDs, so that was a bit unusual for a think tank. So there was lots of opportunity to rise and gain, you know, without without a degree. And typically you would choose one topic and work on it for a year. And that suited me. So I worked on environmental taxation, subsidizing the environment. I worked on third world debt. Those, and those led to monographs and, and one book. Mm-hmm. So it was a long time before I felt like I wasn't growing anymore because I was able to move to new topics mm-hmm. and because I was writing in different forms that were increasingly challenging. Yeah, I very often hear the career advice that early on you should like move every couple of years. Uh, and I think if the job that you're in early on is not a good fit, that's definitely the right advice. But it does kind of surprise me that there isn't more of a premium placed on uh, expertise, like someone's developed expertise in a particular area. And also the fact that they would have like institutional knowledge and things like that. It seems a bit crazy to have like organizations turning over almost all of their staff every few years. Uh, am, I, am I crazy? Because I feel like if, if I was like leaving job every two years, I'd feel like I would just be getting started almost by that point because I've, I've learned so much in the meantime. I certainly would never recommend it as a blanket policy. Hmm. But other organizations I've been in, it's just clear from how things work that after a couple of years, if you start you know, as a junior person, you don't get as much opportunity to grow typically. That was the case at the Center for Global Development. That was a little bit more like um, an academic department in the sense that there were almost all the fellows were PhDs, basically, except for me. And then there were research assistants, and they didn't have much prospect of becoming full-time fellows without a lot more you know, research or job experience. And that might be a, a bit the case at, at GiveWell. There's a fair amount of turnover at the junior level, and I think... I mean, there's some, obviously we have some long-time people. And I think that's uh, because organizationally it's kind of a, a broad pyramid. There's a lot of work at the, I don't like, lowest sounds like a pejorative level, but the level of where we're checking in on organizations, researching new organizations, writing up conversations and so on, which might start to get old after a couple of years. It's vital work, mm. but uh, moving to the next level, rung in responsibility, there's many, there's much Many fewer positions, just less mm-hmm. needed because it's so broad, flat pyramid. So it's normal in this case, I think, for people to leave in order to grow. Mm. Yeah, perhaps what's more surprising is that it seems like the advice of people in the middle of their career is that kind of each time they change organization, they can get a pay rise and potentially quite a significant one. And it, yeah, it seems odd to me that organizations aren't willing to pay more to kind of retain people who have experience. Uh, I, I suppose the alternative thing would be that uh, they're learning things by hiring people from outside. So that's like creating an information transfer. And perhaps that's what's getting valued a lot. Do you have a view on that? It's, it's a funny thing. It's not something I've thought about much, nor experienced that much. Yeah. <laughs> My intuition is that maybe um, the search cost for, for, for our new employees is so high that mm. when you're making an offer, you want to reduce the probability they're going to walk away. I see. Because of the, you know, a particular increment in salary. I, I, that's, that would be my guess about what it is. So coming back to the, to the think tanks, uh, the World Watch Institute and the Center for Global Development, uh, do you think you had much impact there? And do you think people in general can have significant policy impact in think tanks? I don't know if I have had much impact. Uh, you know, as we've discussed, my, I'm less practically oriented in a sense. I don't have the concrete man, you know, decision-making experience. And so I've always been interested in broad ideas like whether environmental taxing, taxing pollution is a good idea and how it should be done. Hopefully, I have educated people. A lot of you know, World Watch materials were used in, in classrooms, so I've introduced to people to new ideas. And I always see myself as a teacher, a pedagogue. Uh, but that's hard to measure. But I've absolutely observed colleagues who had much more focused policy proposals have impact. My, Michael Clemens, my former colleague at, at, at the Center for Global Development, played a really key role, I think, in opening up a particular work visa program to Haitians after the earthquake there, giving them another way to make money. And another colleague, Todd Moss, played a key role in bringing about a deal to 
write down about $30 billion of debt owed by Nigeria, which helped it get beyond the debt crisis. It's a lot more money than he could have earned and given away. That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what fraction of responsibility do you think he deserves for, for kind of that policy shift? Like 1%, 10%, 0.1%? Um, I should be careful what I say. I mean, if I might offend somebody who feels like I'm underrating their contribution. Uh, and in a sense, it's not um, decomposable into a fraction. It's more like a Several things had to happen, and if any one of them didn't happen, then it might, the whole thing might not have happened. Yeah. But um, I believe that CGD was approached by the people in the Nigerian government for help to do some outside analysis, and he did a great job of it in that case. I think we actually have a write-up on this. I forget if it's public, but we did a pretty deep review of the Center for Global Development and its impacts. Yeah, I'll stick, stick up a link to that. Do you have a sense of how competitive it is to, to work at think tanks if you're a recent graduate? Uh, I think it's there's supply and demand, right? I think a lot of recently graduated PhDs are pretty leery of going into the think tank world because it basically represents a permanent decision not to pursue an academic career. Because if you are going to spend, say, three or five years at a think tank or do some real work there, and then you decide to actually want an academic tenure track position, then you're three to five years behind in your life in a sense. Mm -hmm. So that narrows the demand for such jobs. The number of slots... Probably not huge. Uh, the Center for Global Development in the 12 years I was there, I think, hired two newly minted PhDs, mm -hmm. Michael Clemens and Justin Sandifer. Now, I guess there are a few hundred think tanks, so maybe that's a few hundred positions mm -hmm. over, over a decade. Uh, so it doesn't seem like a huge number, uh, but I don't know quite how the supply and demand balance out. I think what distinguishes you in competition is just your seriousness. If you have demonstrated you're good and you demonstrate your interest in the relevant subject areas and you show that you're willing to leave academia and do this. I think that right there that puts you in a pretty small pool. For the last few years, 80,000 Hours has had working in a think tank as a pretty promising uh, option for recent undergraduates or people yeah. who just left, left their undergraduate degree. But I don't know many people who've, who've done it. Do you think that might be because it's, like, it's hard to get in or maybe there's nearby options that are more appealing? I don't know. Sure. I experienced the side of... The process after people have been hired, you know, so yeah. on the other side of the filter. Yeah. Uh, most of the research assistants that I saw come and go at CGD, I think, had a pretty good couple of years. That's typically how long they would stay. Yeah. And typically then went to graduate school. Some would go into U.S. government, say, work for USAIDs. Yeah, I, I, you might not know much about, about these options, but I guess the, some nearby alternatives are kind of going into civil service directly or uh, working in Congress as a staffer. Do you have any view on whether that's kind of a better or worse option than, than working in a think tank? Or I suppose it gets, might appeal to different kinds of people. Sure. I think you can learn a huge amount. Um, the thing with government is it, it is so much variability. There, there are places that are completely stultified or, or maybe under attack from people at the top in the Trump administration. Uh, and then there are other places, I, I believe, where my, my wife worked in, in Medicare, where there was a lot of innovation going on. And... The work is almost automatically at a different scale. You know, for a think tank, maybe 20 people is big, but for a government agency, 20 people is nothing. And so you can quickly become into something that's really consequential and got a lot of interesting people and a lot of moving parts and even a lot of flexibility in what role you can play depending on what you have to offer. Yeah. There's someone I know in, in the UK who managed to end up leading a think tank in their early 30s and was just very big in the media, like would, would be in newspapers like on a weekly basis. So, I mean, it was a fairly small organization, but most think tanks, as you say, are really quite small. So if you have star potential, then I think you can, can rise quite fast. That's right. And that might also go for activist NGO groups, you know, nonprofit groups that are focusing on policy. In a normal think tank, that's not the, the World Watch Institute, how much can people advance without getting a PhD? And kind of what, what exit, exit opportunities do they have? Uh, my experience is limited, but my impression is that CGD is typical and that it's very hard to advance without a PhD. I was I came into CGD at a middle rung between research assistant and full fellow, having been, you know, a so-called senior researcher in my previous job. So I just barely jumped over that stream. Uh, and that was unusual. And I think that that's generally what you'll find at other think tanks. I mean, there'll be, there'll be PhDs at the, at, who are leading most of the research or in a sense at the top. There'll also be people who are formerly prominent officials in government. But uh, depending on who you work for, and that's something to figure out, you can still be given you know, a major co-authoring role in whatever's done if you demonstrate the capacity. Okay, so you mentioned writing, uh, writing a book. How, how did that go? Uh, 
Well, I've, I've written two books, one at World Watch and one at the um, Center for Global Development. The second one, which was on microfinance, I think was a much more successful project. That was, that was great. It took a long time. Early on, the communications director, Lawrence McDonald, and I hit upon the idea of my writing the book in public. This is the microfinance book. Mm. So, Publishing uh, drafts of it, you mean? Yeah, the idea is uh, when I got a draft chapter, put it online. This was in 2009. And it emerged out of a particular chapter where I kept feeling like I was making more discoveries about the history of microfinance. But I must be missing things. Why don't I share this and people can fill in blanks? So we turned that into a blog. So I stumbled into blogging and I quickly discovered it was way more fun than book writing. <laughs> I have a sort of natural letter writing voice when I blog. And it just, it's, whereas when I write a book, I feel much more like I'm clearing my throat and standing at a podium before an audience <laughs> wearing a suit. I guess you get a, lot, get a lot more engagement as well quicker. Yeah. It's like a more immediately rewarding. That's right. So I found in many days it was much easier to blog than write the book. So it slowed the book down. <laughs> but it brought in a lot of attention to my project and I became much more better known. Mm. I got some some good comments on the book, but it all, and it ultimately served the purpose of the book, which was to communicate my thinking um, to the community and beyond the microfinance community and beyond it. And so it was a very useful thing. And it happened that I, I started that just at a, a very eventful few years in the world of microfinance. There were some credit bubbles that exploded. Um, the prime minister of Bangladesh went after Muhammad Yunus, the creator, creator of microcredit in, in Bangladesh, went after him personally. Uh, there was more. And well, so I became kind of the leading figure tracking these developments and interpreting them. Uh, and then ultimately uh, that fed into the book and made the book better. And the, the book included about 12 of my uh, favorite blog posts. So. But I think it was a pretty unusual thing then, and still fairly now, to have to be writing a book in public. I'm tempted to say I was the first one to do it properly defined, but that's probably there's an exception out there. Did that book have policy impact? It seems like if a lot of people were reading it, it could have affected funding levels. I think it was part of a process within the microfinance world of developing and communicating more real, realistic expectations of what microfinance can do. I wouldn't say I did it alone. Yeah, do, do you want to give people a sneak peek of what the conclusion was on that? Oh, one? yeah. Well, so microcredit had a reputation pr partly because of this very complicated study that we talked about earlier that was non-randomized of being a silver bullet against poverty, especially when given to women. Mm. Very powerful set of messages. Actually, that was another important set of events that occurred while I was blogging, which is the first randomized trials came along and showed essentially zero impact on poverty. But I came to appreciate through uh, one fantastic book, uh, Portfolios of the Poor, that financial services, although they're invisible, are really important. You know, being poor in a poor country means that your income is not only low but unpredictable. And you have all sorts of risks that are uninsured. You don't have health insurance, life insurance, whatever. And so your financial life is much more about uncertainty than it is for people who have salaries. And one of the ways you manage that is by finding mechanisms, formal or informal, to turn your small and often unpredictable income streams, in your income increments, into pots of money that are there in a case of emergency, which you can then um, use for getting your husband's broken leg you know, treated, what have you. And most financial services can play that role. You can save for your kids' education because in most developing countries, the reality is you got to pay for school. Mm -hmm. You can borrow and then the need to pay, make those monthly payments or weekly payments is helpful discipline for you in effect, sort of a retroactive way of making you save for, mm -hmm. uh, for schooling. In some cases, you can get informal insurance. You can also get money transferred to you from your, your, your son in the United States or in the, the big city. So these you know, credit, insurance, savings, and transfers are all financial services. But in a sense, they all, all help people solve the same problem. And what's funny is that poor people have less money and because as a result, they actually need financial services more. Mm. And so the project of creating self-sustaining institutions that can deliver services like that to poor people, to me, seems a fundamentally good one. Uh, the, what I worry about is that the uh, enthusiasm from donors and investors to support microfinance has created a strong tilt towards microcredit. Mm. And as we know, loans, you know, credit is very dangerous when it's given too enthusiastically. It can get, get the borrowers in trouble. It can create bubbles and so on. And so I came to favor microfinance as a, as a big project, but actually advocate for people putting less money into it, and which would shift microfinance finance institutions more towards away from taking money from investors in the United States and other places and more towards taking savings from local people, which is both a useful service and an alternative source of finance.
And I guess insurance as well? Micro yes, insurance? to the extent it's practical. There are a lot of difficulties in providing microinsurance, but there are also some nice encouraging examples of it. So I came to feel that it, it was by no means a silver bullet, but uh, could do a lot of good for, on the long run, for a merit, fairly modest investments if you can build self-sufficient institutions. Okay, I just wanted to flag for listeners that uh, there was a bunch of other um, research that you've done that, that we could have talked about, including uh, changing murder rates in the US over the last couple of years, um, the effect of alcohol taxes on health, uh, the effect of immigrants on, on wages, the Commitment to Development Index, which is an uh, attempt to look at how policies other than just aid policy affect uh, the developing world, and effects of development, and uh, in particular, like reducing infant mortality on um, fertility. Uh, so I'll stick up links. I'll try to be pretty comprehensive and stick up links to, to all of these different projects if, if one of those topics uh, grabs you. So are there any high-impact job opportunities available uh, at the moment that you think listeners might be able to fill? I suppose uh, there's, there's some vacancies at the Open Philanthropy Project that I think it's possible that those will have closed by the time this, this episode goes up. Although I think they're planning on like continuing to take uh, applications on a kind of rolling basis. Yeah, I don't know the time, but I know that we're doing a big hiring push for research analysts on the open philanthropy side. So just as a, as a last question, uh, are there any any books or papers or uh, podcasts you've listened to recently that were particularly memorable that you want to recommend to people? Well, I listened to some great podcasts in this series. So I encourage people to look at the earlier episodes. And I, on the suggestion of my colleague, uh, Luke Melhauser, I looked at a, read a couple books recently on moral psychology, which is the scientific study of moral reasoning in humans. And you know, occasionally you read a book that changes how you see the world a bit. And, and these, these books are like that. I especially enjoyed, well, the one was by Jonathan Haidt. Uh, I'm blanking on the title. What's not? I should have Righteous it. Mind. Righteous Mind, yes. Yeah. And that's a great book. It's very clear, clear messaging. And then there's one by Joshua Green called Tribal Mind, I think. And I've especially found Joshua Green's book exciting because he first talks about some of what we understand about how people think when it comes to moral questions. Mm-hmm. You know, he emphasizes that we are evolved for cooperation within groups in order to compete with other groups. And a lot of what you might call social emotions, embarrassment, vengefulness, and so on. Loyalty. Loyalty, yes, can be explained, you know, through evolutionary, maybe just so stories, uh, as uh, fast brain devices that mold our behavior to improve our ability to cooperate within groups. Uh, but the problem we face today is that many of our biggest Uh, challenges require cooperation between groups in order to solve them. And we don't have these automatic mechanisms in place that just automatically make us want to cooperate across groups. And he argues, he moves from the empirical analysis of how people think morally to proper moral philosophy. And he argues for utilitarianism on pragmatic grounds as a common currency across tribes, across moral tribes. You may believe that there's a right to life. I may believe that there's you know, a right to choice when it comes to abortion. That's not an argument that ever can be resolved through reason. But we can both agree with the basic ideas of utilitarianism, that everybody's happiness should count about the same, and that happiness itself is a really important thing, a good thing to maximize. And then he tries to analysis, analyze, for example, the abortion problem through a utilitarian lens. But the big point is he's not saying that as I read it, that utilitarianism is the true morality. And he's not saying that it's a complete morality for any one person or any one tribe, but that it's a way for tribes to work together to solve solve real problems. And I just find the whole set of ideas to be really uh, intriguing, exciting. My guest today has been David Rudman. Thanks for coming on the show, David. It's been a pleasure. Just a reminder that you can get updates on all the articles we publish by joining our research newsletter at 80,000hours.org slash newsletter. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.